question for the board's benefit, Jeff, when you might be here tonight. He called me at quarter of six. He has pneumonia. Oh, Chris Clutchman is on the hot seat. <laughs> she can handle it. I can't even turn on the reporter, so. <laughs> hold on, hold on, hold on. Just some best. Okay, we're good. It's going? Yep. Okay. Um, I don't know, did anybody hear anything from Jay at all? I'm not sure. Paul? <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> I guess you know, and we'll see what happens. Might have zoned out on that. Don't All right, first item on the agenda is 2 Robbins Road. This was continued from March 15th. Um, I guess, oh, well, there's Paul. Hey, Paul. Good, good. Um, Chris has laid out somewhat of a preliminary forum for discussion tonight. I guess one of the things we take up really is Bob showed is here from MDN and doesn't necessarily have to be here or for the entire meeting. Does anyone have any specific concerns or questions on traffic? Well, um, Mr. Chair, Bob is here for the Two Robins Road project and so he can be here for that entire hearing. It's just if we have, if you oh, want okay. him for the second hearing, if you could be thinking if there are any traffic related issues for the residences at West Road West project, if we could take those early in that hearing, that would be appreciated. Right. But he Very is good. here Very totally good. for this hearing, okay. Um. So if you would, Mr. Chair, we're hoping for an initial discussion of traffic by the applicant. Um, the uh, peer review uh, response, civil engineering, um, and then any discussions of waivers and any and looking for comments from the board and then we'll review the comments that we've received from town departments. That's the agenda for the two Robins Road project this evening. You're on, gentlemen. Mr. Chairman, good evening. Uh, for the record, Dan Endike with Princeton Properties. Uh, it's good to be back. I just wanted to do a quick introduction and um, get things rolling and try to be as efficient as possible this evening. Um, like Chris said, we, we expect to hopefully get through the traffic presentation from Jeff to my right, Jeff Dirk, and then move into any open comments from the peer review engineer on that matter, and then move into the civil peer review issues. I don't think it's necessary for the uh, civil engineer to present again this evening. They made that presentation last time, but here this evening are Joe Pesnola and Brian Goudreau from Hancock Associates. Um, I wanted to make one comment. In, in, there was a directive, um, I think, from Mr. Earl and, and from the board at the last hearing. Um, and, and the one issue that came up was our fire, uh, the, the letter from the fire department and the issues that they raised on access and site, uh, the, getting the trucks in and into the building safely and the, the ladders to the building safely. We took that very seriously. Uh, Brian and I went and met with Lieutenant Parsons on March 17th. Uh, Brian did a lot of work to satisfy his concerns. Uh, we showed him an appropriate secondary access that we'll, we'll incorporate into the plans, are incorporated into the plans. Uh, the sweat path analysis was done. I think he was comfortable with that. And there were a few other issues that got resolved um, since our last hearing. We were fortunate to get a letter from the fire department that I think is part of your packages that I think essentially says that if the project does move forward, they're satisfied with the response that we've uh, provided to them. And they also offer a few conditions that they'd like to see put into the comprehensive permit. For the record, we are fine with that. We, they're they're um, easy to accommodate and we're happy to do it. So, um, and as Chris said, if we can get through these two issues this evening, and I think we will because of the dialogue that we've had um, over the past month, I think they're in good order. I not to get too far ahead of myself, but I think at our next hearing, we'd be looking to do the architectural peer review and the fiscal impact report, and then move things forward from there. So with that said, I turn it over to Jeff. And uh, just a quick question, as long as you're on that subject, because I didn't think that it was actually <coughs> uh, determined at the last meeting, but it sounds as though it is now. You're going to have the one entrance. We're going to have rather than I know Andrew was talking originally um, about perhaps leaving both of them open if the board yes we're going to have the one entrance and we're going to have a secondary emergency access um, just closer up to that will access onto 
Robbins Road, it will be, be closer to 110, and it will be with Grass Creek, and it will be gated in, in uh, Knox Washington. Right. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. For the record, my name is Jeffrey Dirk, principal with Vanessa Associates, and we're the traffic engineers for the project. Um, I do want to mention, as, as Dan had mentioned initially, we did have the opportunity or benefit to have a peer review done of the traffic study. Um, and I do um, want to thank your review consultant. I was on vacation last week, um, and he did complete an expedited review and was very forthright in trying to get me uh, comments before I went away on vacation so that this meeting could be productive and um, have us have the ability to respond to those comments. So we were able to do all of that, and I do want to thank your consultant for doing that because it was kind of above and beyond, so we, I do appreciate that very much. Uh, so I have a very brief PowerPoint presentation for you tonight just to summarize the traffic study. I believe it was included in your packet as well for those of you who have a chance to look at it, so I'll, I'll go through it and be relatively brief so that you can hear from your review consultant as well. Uh, so in going through the traffic study, um, it follows a standard format, as you have heard probably before, there's a series of standards and pr criteria that we have to follow, and, and one of the rules of your review consultant is to make sure that we follow all of those standards. So uh, we did follow those standards. Um, they're set by the Massachusetts Department of Transportation, um, as well as you have standards within your bylaws as well that tell us how we need to go about conducting the traffic study. So the study was conducted in accordance with all of those parameters. And just in terms of the, some of the findings that we had, just overall reaching findings, um, as you've probably heard presented before, um, the site is occupied by an existing office building. And so one of the tasks that we had was to look at a comparison of the impacts of this project in relation to um, the existing office building, um, should it be reoccupied by a use um, similar to what was there previously. And what we found was that in general during the peak commuter hours, the traffic volumes of this project are less. And so it's a less pronounced impact on the transportation infrastructure compared to what the office building would generate. On a daily basis, this project does generate more traffic. So as you looked at traffic over a 24-hour basis, it's slightly more than the office building. But during those spikes in traffic that you have during the commuter hours, we actually generate less traffic. And the other important thing is you look at Robbins Road in particular, given that it has office uses, as you think about those traffic patterns, most of the office traffic is coming in in the morning, and that's kind of opposite of what we're doing, we're, we're exiting, uh, and the reverse happens in the evening. So most of the traffic is exiting Robbins Road uh, for the office component, and then our traffic is entering. What's important about that is you think about the queuing, the backups that happen on Robbins Road. Um, we wouldn't be adding to the volume or the queuing of traffic exiting during the evening peak hour, which is when those queues are longer, because most of our traffic is entering. So it kind of works in a complementary fashion with respect to the office uses along that roadway itself. And that was another uh, finding of the traffic study. There is queuing that happens, but we're not substantially adding to it, given that our traffic is opposite the volume, of, uh, the traffic patterns that are on Roberts Road from the office project. So another couple things that we found um, in looking at uh, motor vehicle crash history along Littleton Road, because that's most important as we're talking about safety, there were no safety deficiencies found in that section of roadway. And your review consultant also was uh, pointed out the fact that there was some substantial infrastructure upgrades done, widening the road, the installation of traffic signals uh, that did enhance the safety of the corridor. So what we found in looking at uh, what's been going on since those improvements were in place, um, basically they're functioning in a, in a very good level in that there isn't a pronounced uh, motor vehicle crash in that area. So that's important because you don't want to be adding traffic to a roadway that has safety deficiencies. So we, we did find that as a part of the uh, assessment that was done. The other important thing is sight lines at our driveways. As you know, in looking at 40B projects, safety is first and foremost. Um, we were talking about emergency vehicle access. Motor vehicle crashes are also important, but also sight lines at the driveways. So as we looked at the um, sight lines from the single point of access into the project site, uh, there's a clear line of sight from the driveway to the Littleton Road. So someone exiting the project can see clearly all the way up to 110. The same thing for someone that's turning off of 110 and heading on Robbins Road towards the project. They have a clear line of sight to the driveway. And then looking in the other direction towards the office buildings to the south of the site, again, we have over 500 feet of sight distance in that direction. So from the standpoint of access and public safety, what we found in conclusion of the study is that there's no safety deficiencies relative to the existing roadway or the functioning of our driveways. So, Chris, if you can go to the next slide. 
what I've shown on the next slide is a study area that we have evaluated for the project. And basically what it encompasses is the Route 110 corridor from Concord Road West all the way to the uh, Red Hat Netscape driveway, the two signals at those locations, as well as the Robbins Road intersection and then the access points into our project. Um, there's two access points. We'll be using only the southern access for access into the property. Um, it, as I mentioned, we looked at existing conditions in the area, both motor vehicle crashes, speed of traffic on those roadways, volume of traffic on the roadways. And then Chris, if you go to the next slide. And probably most important is uh, pedestrian and bicycle accommodations. Um, this is a residential project. Uh, we do acknowledge, obviously, it's going to generate some traffic. But what's important from our standpoint is to reduce those traffic volumes. Um, one of the ways to do that is encourage pedestrian and bicycle travel, but also take advantage of the fact that we have the Route 15 bus um, going right by the site. There's two bus stops that are showing where the bees are in um, the slide here. Um, so these are, these are uh, opportunities for us to reduce our traffic volumes. And what I do want to mention as you look at the slide is what's very distinctly missing is a section of sidewalk between Robbins Road on the south side between Robbins Road and the signal up at Red Hat Netscape. So it's very pronounced as you look at this that that's missing. And so as we looked at opportunities again for the project, it's to fill these missing gaps. We want to have residents be able to walk and get out to a bus stop along 110 so that they don't need to get into their car. And providing this missing piece of sidewalk, getting a sidewalk from our site along Robbins Road, then along 110, and then potentially looking at reconfiguring these bus stops so that they're located at the signals. And I think this is one of the things that your consultant had mentioned as well. We have signalized crosswalks, as you see in blue at both of the signals on either side. So if we have the ability of someone to be able to get to those signals and push a push button to be able to cross the road, that provides opportunities for us to reduce traffic volumes and people can ride the bus. <coughs> we think that's important given that that's an amenity that we have in the area. So just to be clear, Jeff, this is existing conditions. This is not existing conditions, proposed. yes. Just to be clear for the Yes, board. existing conditions and opportunities for us, I guess I would look at it uh, from that standpoint. So we did work with your planning department to identify uh, development projects in the area that are expected to add traffic. As we looked at existing conditions, we're also looking to the future, and our projections are seven years in the future. That's what we're required to look at. So uh, we were looking at the year 2023 from the standpoint of our existing conditions. We're 2016, and we're going seven years in the future to 2023 at the time. Um, and so we work with the planning department to identify those projects in the area that haven't been constructed. I think most importantly, um, in looking at those projects is we included the um, residential project next door that's second on your agenda. So that traffic was included in our, our traffic projections as well as the rest of the office build out that may happen in that area. Uh, there were a few other small projects along, or, uh, along 110 in the area that we also included. Uh, one of the things that your consultant had asked us to do um, was to include, um, I think it's the Orchard... Square. Square project because that was not included in their original projections. And then something that's often overlooked is vacant office space. So right at the end of our road, um, as your consultant was looking at, kind of just looking at the signs in the area, there's, there's vacant office space. So those office buildings at the end of Robbins Road are not fully occupied. So we reoccupied the space. There was about 80,000 square feet of space. So we backed those numbers in as well. Um, so as we looked at um, existing conditions around Robbins Road today, it's not a high volume roadway. It's about uh, just under a thousand vehicles during the peak hour. And one of the reasons for its low volume is because that office space isn't occupied. So we backfilled all of that office space in our traffic projections. So what's shown on this slide is what we're expecting this project, so the 180 residential units, what we expect the net new traffic on the roadway will be. We did not account for the fact of anyone using the, one, uh, the Route 15 bus. So we basically said everyone who lives here is going to drive their car. So that's kind of a worst case scenario. If we can get people to use public transportation, these numbers will go down. So worst case, everyone drives associated with the project. Um, we're expecting the project will generate 1,254 new two-way trips, so over 24 hours. It's 627 vehicles entering, 627 out. Um, that does include everything, so it's FedEx, UPS, everything you might imagine that you'd need to service a residential project. Uh, during the commuter peak hour, so the highest traffic volume hour in the morning, one hour between 7 and 9, and that's when the volumes are going to kind of peak and spike. We expect the project would generate 96 new vehicle trips over that one hour period. Uh, the majority is exiting, as you might imagine, in the morning. So 78 exiting, 
18 entering. And again, as you look at that, that exiting traffic, is, it's coming out of Robbins Road, whereas the majority of the office traffic is coming in. So it's offset from that. In the evening, we expect the project will generate 122 uh, new vehicle trips. This is a one hour period between four and six in the evening, and that's when the volumes again will spike at their highest level. Like the majority, of course, will be entering it in the evening. Chris, if you can go to the next slide. So what this slide shows is the comparison of the traffic from the, our project, the residential project, compared to the office building. So if that existing office building, which is currently vacant, if it was occupied by another office user, uh, what this shows in the middle column is how much traffic the office building would generate. And as I had mentioned in my opening remarks, uh, we expect an increase on a daily basis. We're expecting that this project would generate 370 additional vehicle trips over a 24-hour basis and compared to the office building. And this just has to do with the fact that the office building, it kind of comes in and it goes out and then there's nothing happening before or after those time periods, whereas this is a residential project. So after 6 o'clock, we're still generating traffic, whereas the office building is pretty much you know, negligible at that time periods. But during those spikes in the morning and the spike in the evening, we're expecting a slight reduction in traffic. And the reason for that is our traffic is more dispersed. So over that one or two hour period, let's say, in the evening when you've got high volume of traffic, uh, the office building tends to be, you know, hit five o'clock or it's, you know, somewhere around eight or nine o'clock in the morning and everyone needs to get in there. Uh, so that they make sure that they're at their desk by, like, say, 8 or 9 o'clock in the morning. So you have a surge that happens. That's different from, an, from a residential project where people are kind of more dispersed in terms of their arrivals and departures. So let's just say if you did work somewhere else in the town and you had to be there by 9, you're going to leave earlier than that uh, from the residential project to make sure that you're at your desk within that time period. Whereas if you were at that office building, everything kind of is coming in at the same time to make sure that you're there. So that's why... Our traffic is more dispersed over those peak hours, so we show a reduction in traffic compared to the office use. About 30 trips in the morning and about uh, 23 trips during the evening, so we're, that's a lower volume. So what this slide here shows is the distribution of traffic. Once we've estimated how much traffic we expect the project's going to generate, uh, we have to assign that traffic out to Littleton Road and to the various intersections we've studied. And the way that we've done that is we've looked at uh, U.S. Census data, so journey to work information from the census. So we looked at persons that reside within the town of Westford, and you report to the census where do you work and how do you get to work, basically. And so we can look at that information given that we have a residential project and say we expect that the people that live in this residential community will generally work in the same areas as the rest of the residents in the town. Then we can take those numbers in terms of employment centers look at the existing traffic counts that we had done in the roadway network and then come up with a pattern. So how people will use the roadway to get to those various employment centers. And that's what's shown on this slide here. So we expect that as people are entering and exiting the site, about 60% of that traffic is going to be oriented to and from the east. I think some of that will be obviously getting on at the 495 interchange at Boston Road or continuing on along 110 towards Chelmsford. Uh, and then the balance, 40%, 20% is heading towards the Littleton area on 110, and then we have about 20% heading north on uh, Route 225, so Concord Road West in that direction there. So that's how the traffic from the project uh, generally orients itself. Just, just a general question, yes. not necessarily relative to your project or your project only. Yes. You said this is done by census? Correct. How many of those are sent out, and what is the percentage of responses? Actually, a good question. I think that this latest information is from the 2010 um, census information, and it might have it's so I'm not sure what the response rate is in Westford. I could look at how many responses they actually have, because I think it does list that. I could actually follow up with an email on that, because it does list how many responses were actually received, so you can look at that in terms of your total population and get kind of a gauge as to... Um, what percentage it actually represents of the total population of the town. I'd be interested in seeing that because regardless of what anyone is talking about, when these studies or surveys are sent out, you know, if you send out 500 and you get 100 back. That's pretty you know, good, actually, if you're... <laughs> so that's right. I'd be curious to see Yeah, it, it's never as large a sample size as you'd like, I can tell you that. It's, yeah, it's very, and so what the Census um, Bureau does is they do some adjustments to it to account for the fact that in some instances they get a low response rate. 
uh, given the fact they've been doing this for you know, many years. Uh, so they do do some statistical analysis to be able to normalize some of the data. But seven years old. Yes. Yeah. The other thing that's important about it, that is not to rely upon that as your sole source, and that's where to look at the existing traffic patterns. So the first thing, just to get general population areas, to you know where where are people employed. Uh, but then to look at the existing traffic patterns to know how do people, if, if you're saying people are going to work in Boston, then looking at the roadway network and saying, well, how are people actually driving on the road? You know, how many people are going east-west or using the various um, travel routes to get to those points? So we're able to refine it based on that. And then I think the thing that you never want to see is if I'm looking at and saying it's, you know, 62% or 63.5%, it's never that fine-grained. So we, that's why we round these numbers off just in terms of, you know, you see 60%, 20%, 20%, because it's never going to be that exact. The other thing that's important is your review consultant, as they look at our numbers, they're also kind of looking to see if there was a 10% variation or something like that in those numbers, what does that mean? Because I would do the same thing when I do my reviews is to say, if they're off by 10%, would that dramatically change the conclusions of the study? And if it would, then generally what they would say is just test it and tell us what the answer is. Again, from the standpoint of we're not that exact and we want to make sure that there's some um, uh, reasonableness in terms of the variable, variability. And I think to further compound that, what your consultant has asked for, and I, and I agree with this, is to do the monitoring. And they probably asked for this in other projects, is to say, I may say it's 60-40 split, but what if it's not? And what if I end up with more traffic turning left coming out of Robbins Road versus making a right? Because that will have a profound, profound impact on the queuing and the way the intersection operates. So the monitoring program allows you to look at all these assumptions, but then go back and say, real world, after you've got the project occupied at a certain level, is it meeting these projections? And if not, then we report back to you saying it's actually 70-30, and what is the implication of that? You know, I've done some analysis. I've said, here's what the queue is. But if it is a different distribution pattern or a different amount of traffic generated by the project, we would have to report to you, here's what the actual numbers are, and then here's what the actual impacts are, not projections. So that's one of the things your consultant has recommended as, a part, as something as you consider um, your conditions of approval. And, and I generally recommend that when I'm doing reviews as well. A spin-off question to that, and I didn't mean to. Let's interrupt your presentation, oh, but, uh, and I don't know, you'll have to forgive me, I, I didn't stupidly think that we had a packet tonight, but I got it, and I went through almost all of it. So I don't know whether it was your project or the next one, but um, there was uh, doc, uh, commentary in there about doing after monitoring after the place is 75% um, full or 80% full or whatever. Um, so you certainly don't have a problem with monitoring after the fact then. But the, I guess the second piece of that question is, uh, and I don't know whether it's for you or Chris perhaps, if by chance your projections are wrong with regards to right turn, left turn, or whatever, um, what ability do we have to ask you to do something to mitigate that? Uh, we put in as a condition, Chris, or something, I guess? Or? You, I believe that you could do that. Um, and the, what the, um, and I think you could ask Mr. Michaud that as well um, for his expertise in other projects. But him, he has put in kind of costs associated with whether it's changing the signal timing, um, <coughs> other costs associated with the monitoring that the applicant would bear. <coughs> and I would presume that that would mean if there are other follow-on conditions. But I think as, should you, and when we get to developing the conditions, we'll want to look at that language in particular, but I just asked Mr. Michaud to note that and, okay. and answer it for you. It's, it's fairly standard that you would ask for those things, and I think from the standpoint of the applicant, as long as they're known, as, as long as they're known quantities, and as Chris has said, that they can put a dollar value to so they can bring it into the fold of the entire mitigation thing, it's you know, generally something that's, that's acceptable. Um, so I think that's you know, quite common, so you can go to the next slide, please. On that left, back on that, on that left turn from the site heading yes down one ten. What's the distance approximately between that that point of the left turn and the light? It is about I mean, the right turn seems to be a pretty easy maneuver. It is time of the day or you know, right. but that left turn with traffic perhaps backing up is there sufficient distance for traffic to turn left and 
that be blocked by existing traffic waiting for that light? The, the queues will get back close to that intersection, and that's one of the things where we need to make sure that you can actually see it so that as you turn out, you can get into the back of the queue that's there. It's it's approximately 500 feet because this this came, it's a little, might be a little shy of that because this came up under discussion as we were looking at um, potential for a traffic signal there. Um, it doesn't yeah, yeah. it doesn't meet the criteria, but the uh, in terms of volume, but the other the other issue is the spacing. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it as we looked at it, it is right on the cusp of being just below the minimum re recommended spacing of signals uh, to get them to operate effectively. One of the things is the mitigation that we're discussing as a part of this project is a retiming of the two signals that are on either side with the goal of reducing some of that queuing. Um, accommodate the project's traffic, but also make it operate more efficiently so that we clear that space between Robbins Road and the, and the signal. Okay. So that's one of the goals. That's, of the that is, are you done? Yeah, 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 yeah. That is a big item, and I hope perhaps if and after this goes through and everything's up and running, uh, that's, I know that's going to happen because that traffic, I'm going to say probably from 5 to um, well, around 6. I spend most of my time five days a week trying to get through road. there. Um, he backs up beyond Robbins right. Road, at least on the inside lane and sometimes on the outside lane too. So um, I'm hoping that that retiming will take care of that. You people, the professionals, not me. Right. Well, so we think that it we think that it will, and that's why it's a centerpiece of what the mitigation program is. So. You can go to and I'll talk about that in, thank you. Um, so that's one of the things as you look at this, this is your levels of service of the letter grades that you've seen before and just because um, it's so small just in trying to read it, the top, so what's looking, if you look at it going across, so from left to right, that's ex it's um, uh, existing conditions and then it's AM and PM, so left to right, top, thank you. So that's, um, actually I've got one here, Chris, so I can show this as well, thank you. Bob. So this is, um, the top row here is, is existing conditions. This is the morning peak hour, this is the evening peak hour, and then as you go down in the rows, so this is existing, this is the no build condition without the project, this is the build condition with the project. So as you compare the middle to the bottom, if you see a change in any of those letter grades, that means when we added the project's traffic, it caused a impact. So you see a change in level of service. One of the things you don't see here, though, is the queuing. So I can say that it's a D or a C, but that, you know, so it's generally good operating conditions. A D or better is acceptable operating conditions. What we found as we looked at the signalized intersections is, of course, you do have queuing, which is not going to show up in those letter grades there. We don't have an increase in terms of the queuing. So when we add our project's traffic, you didn't see a substantial change in any of the queuing. It might be a vehicle or two um, at most at those locations. The other thing that you don't see in looking at the Concord Road West intersection in particular is that even though I'm reporting a D overall for the intersection, as you come down and make the left-hand turn, it's a very heavy left in the morning, that approach is operating in an E. So even though you have movements that are operating better than a D, we also have sub-movements that are operating worse than a D. And so that's where that signal retiming is important because what it means is I may have an approach, let's say uh, 110 in the morning heading towards the east, that might be at a C or better on that approach, but what it means is so there's a lot of green time given to 110. Meanwhile, the traffic is stacking up on Concord Road. Yes. So the signal's out operating efficiently, and you get the queuing that's happening. So what we're planning to do as a part of the project is to retime both of those traffic signals to account for changes in the traffic patterns, but also better um, accommodate the flows that are there so those queues get shorter and some of the critical approaches at the intersection. So um, that's one of the things that we've said as a part of the project. It'll address the impact from our project, but it'll also make the road function better so that we can get our traffic out of Robbins Road and not be stuck in those queues so that it'll more reflect the patterns that are out there. So the only place that you see the level of service of F, a failing condition, is people coming out of Robbins Road. And that F is for the left turn movement. It's not, not for the right turn. The right turn, if they can get into that pocket that's there, they can make that move when there's a gap in traffic. It's the left coming out. In the morning, it's not a large queue. It's probably in the order of two to five vehicles coming out of there. It's in the evening when people are trying to get out of there. But again, that's where it's important as we look at a, if, 
if we had an office use on the site, we're going to add to that queue in the evening when it's very long. But given that we have a residential use, our traffic is entering versus exiting, and so we're not adding really to the queue that's there. In fact, it's a better condition than if you had the office building occupied. So now the, these are the improvements that we've recommended as a part of the traffic study, and your consultant has, has looked at these and said they're appropriate for the development. Um, so I've kind of broken these up into uh, traffic signal improvements, pedestrian improvements, and then we'll talk about transportation demand management measures. So the signal improvements I've, I've spoken about is retiming those two traffic signals. Um, an important part of that as well is the pedestrian crossing times and the yellow and all red clearance intervals. Those are safety um, pieces of those signalized intersections. So the yellow and all red clearance intervals are basically as you... As the, as the name implies, it's to get traffic through the intersection. So the yellow allows traffic to clear, and then the all red is that safety factor. So you're supposed to have nobody in that intersection for about two seconds, so that if someone did squeak through there on that last yellow just before it turned red, the all red allows them to get through the intersection before the green light comes up. So we want to make sure that both of those times are appropriate for the speed of traffic at the intersection. So we're going to update those if necessary. And then the pedestrian crossing times, just to make sure they meet current standards, because there were some changes in terms of the crossing times they had across the intersection. I suspect, given that the signals were recently updated, that they're probably appropriate and meet the current criteria, but we'll review those to make sure that it's uh, up to standards. Again, because we want people walking from the site, and we'll talk about the pedestrian improvements, but we need to have those signal timings appropriate so that people can get across the road and they feel it's a safe crossing. So the pedestrian improvements, I mentioned filling those missing gaps. So what we've recommended is construct the sidewalk. Basically, it'll, it's two pieces. Construct the sidewalk from the southern access to our project up along Robbins Road, along the east side to get to 110. Then construct the sidewalk along 110 so that you create that or fill the missing gap, but also construct a crosswalk across Robbins Road with wheelchair ramps uh, that are ADA compliant. So then what you have is continuous sidewalk all the way from Concord Road West all the way along the south side of 110 to get to the next signal. Um, and that allows us to also have that opportunity of having the bus stop at um, either one. I think what was suggested is that we put the, uh, the um, bus stops potentially at the Red Hat Net Scout uh, intersection so that that's where you'd have the push button control on either side so that outbound buses coming from Lowell if they're heading towards uh, Littleton you'd need to cross the road in the evening to be able to get back to our project site. So you'd have the benefit of the signal and be able to push a button to cross to get to our side as well. I'd just one other thing um, I'd like you to consider, and it's also for the next applicant too when he gets there, um, extending, extending that sidewalk on the south, south side of 110 to the left down to Concord Road with a crosswalk there. Mm -hmm. Because in fact the sidewalk on the north side of 110 runs all the way down to Orchard Square. Yes. So those people should have the ability without going all the way up to Concord Road to cross, to cross. down there. So consideration should be given to a small piece of sidewalk there and a crosswalk to go across just below the 99. Okay. So that, and our intent is to make sure that at least in this area here we have continuous circulation. So that's something that we, we take a look at as well. Thank you. And Chris, if you can go to the next slide. Mm -hmm. So the last piece of the mitigation program, aside from the monitoring, which I'll, I'll let your consultant um, speak about, is this transportation demand management program. So this is basically measures that we will do uh, as a part of the management of the project to encourage people to use public transportation. Um, the most important thing is um, these first two things, which is um, the property owner to become a Mass Rides employer partner. So what that does is this is a free service that's operated, uh, offered by the Commonwealth um, through the Massachusetts Department of Transportation that basically provides information to the um, property manager to distribute to the, or the residents and any employees they might have there about all of the commuting options that are available. This includes carpool matching, van pool matching. So if there's carpools in the area, even though they may have nothing to do with this project, it might be associated with an office use, what they'll do is try to match up people um, that live at this site with other people in the area that are looking to carpool. So this is all done through a database that MassDOT and Mass Rides maintains to kind of link those people up. And then the critical piece of that is the Emergency Ride Home Program. 
So if you're a Mass Rides employer partner through the Commonwealth, they also offer an emergency ride home program. So if you carpool to work, if you're a resident and live here and you carpool with someone, and for some reason an emergency happens during the day and you need to get back to the site, uh, what they do is they provide like a taxi voucher so that you can get a taxi ride from your employer back to the site and the Commonwealth pays for that. So that's a very important thing that kind of removes that barrier from people thinking that they're going to get stuck if they carpool to work. So that removes that barrier. Uh, the rest of the information is basically providing information to the residents so they know that the Route 15 bus is the air. Here's a schedule for that bus. Here's what the cost is to ride the bus so that they have all of that information as well as um, the um, transportation services that are uh, available at the Gallagher Terminal in Lowell so that they can get the commuter rail. They know that schedule as well. Um, for bicycle um, accommodations, 110, when they did the improvements there, it is sufficiently wide enough and has shoulders for bicycle accommodations. So if you wanted to ride a bike, both, both Concord Road West and 110 have bicycle accommodations, so you're able to ride a bus or ride a bicycle. So within our site, what we need to do is provide areas for people to store their bikes. So inside the garage, weather protected bicycle parking will be provided. And then outside where the clubhouse area is or, or somewhere in that vicinity, have exterior bicycle racks so that you can lock up a bike in that area. So if you ride or visit someone, you've got a place to store your bike. And then the last thing is discussing with the Regional Transit Authority, um, either providing a bus stop for this site or relocating one of their buses along 110, maybe to serve the adjacent residential community as well. And I think that's where your consultant had said, if you move the bus stop down closer to where the signal is at the um, uh, Netscape Red Hat driveway there, where the signal is located, you could service both residential communities. But again, that, that um, sidewalk connections, they all need to be in place so that you can actually get there as well. That concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions you have now or after you hear from your consultant. Just any shows? Would you like to? Not okay if you want. You can, you can stay there. As long as the seat isn't contaminated. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bob, pull the mic a little bit closer to you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, good evening, uh, Mr. Chair, board members. For the record, Robert Misha, a principal with MDM Transportation Consultants uh, based in Marlboro, Massachusetts. Um, as uh, Mr. Dirk kindly pointed out, we, uh, we've done um, a uh, comprehensive peer review of the submitted material, and I think Jeff has done a very nice job at uh, encapsulating our principal concerns. Um, I don't need to recap a lot of that. Um, the, the study and the supplemental submitted material uh, was conducted in conformance with industry standards, so we're satisfied with that, and we think that uh, what was submitted is a fair and reasonable representation of the likely impacts of this project on mm -hmm. the quarter. Um, what's interesting is that this project uh, took the position of including the residential project next door. So this truly does represent um, a valid basis upon which to estimate the combined impact of uh, development in this area. And that translates into the likelihood of having to modify traffic signal timings uh, to accommodate that, that growth uh, pattern. Um, the, um, uh, uh, there, there were some clarifying points that we had requested um, as part of our review uh, that had to do with the site distance, for instance, at the driveway, which was adequately addressed. Um, you know, we were not understanding that one of the two driveways along Robbins Road would be, in fact, an emergency-only driveway. Uh, so um, as it's currently proposed, we find that the driveways are sufficiently, um, will, will provide sufficient accommodation for the uses. Um, uh, public transportation, as Jeff had mentioned, is a very important component, not only for this project, but other residential, emerging residential uses in this quarter. Uh, and to that extent, uh, we find that it would be very beneficial, mutually beneficial for this developer and the adjoining developer to have uh, conversations with the Lowell Regional Transit Authority uh, with, with the view of taking existing stops along that quarter and consolidating them to a common point that would allow for easy access for both residential communities um, at a controlled crossing point so that you could get uh, either inbound or outbound tr uh, trips by using a push-button uh, controlled crossing uh, of the quarter. Uh, the <clears throat> um, there was another clarifying point, and, and that had to do with 
um, how much traffic this project will generate. We concur that um, as a residential use, it will, in the aggregate, generate less vehicle activity than uh, the current or historic use of the property as an office use. Uh, as Mr. Dirk pointed out, uh, in the afternoons in particular, uh, with the outflow of folks leaving to go home. Uh, the vehicle queuing on Robbins Road has historically uh, been an issue, uh, upwards of uh, between uh, seven and nine vehicles queued at that uh, driveway, not enough to warrant an independent traffic signal. Uh, this particular use mitigates that by reversing the travel pattern, so we concur with that. Uh, the only clarifying point is that uh, this use will, in fact, generate a higher level of outbound trip activity in the morning uh, compared to office use. And it's the same point that we made with the adjoining residential property, that when you begin to add up these incremental increases in demand as an outbound movement, uh, the aggregate impact of that is going to drive the need to have to revisit the signal timing al along those, uh, those signals. Uh, they were designed originally for a certain pattern and we know that that pattern in the morning, the commuter pattern, tends to be uh, to the east. Right? It's an eastbound pattern toward the 495 interchange. About two-thirds of the volume on 110 is headed that way in the morning. Uh, and this, as a residential use, will contrib contribute uh, about 30 to 40 additional vehicles to that volume uh, in the morning commute. When combined with the adjoining residential use, which has an outbound demand of 115 more vehicles than an office use, uh, you know, cumulatively, it all adds up. It all adds up. <laughs> uh, and that all leads me to, to uh, the point of our, and, and our recommendation to conduct um, post occupancy monitoring. Uh, we think it's very important that, um, in this case, at a certain occupancy level, we, we define it as 150 units that the applicant go back out and actually measure the performance, the actual volumes that exist at the intersections that were evaluated here, Robbins Road, Concord Road West, and the Red Hat signal, uh, to provide a basis for potentially retiming those signals at that time. Um, now, whether it's you or them and it's them, um, you mean an actual person doing a count? Yes, and there are, there are different ways of conducting that. There are newer technologies that will allow uh, video cameras to actually oh, capture okay. and quantify but those it volumes. it wouldn't be the, uh, the uh, air tube across the No, 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 no. It would either be actual uh, counts. Yeah, and we've actually defined the parameters of what that program would look like in our recommendations. It would uh, be what we call a manual turning movement count during peak hours to include the 7 to 9 a.m. period and the 4 to 6 p.m. period during a weekday. Um, you know, that doesn't necessarily have to be a person, but the turning movement count is a, is a term of art, if you will, in the traffic engineering industry that, that means that um, you're, you're to count and quantify individual turning movements at an intersection during those hours. Whether you do that with a person or a video camera is up to you. Um, and the outcome of that would then allow the engineer to evaluate whether or not to uh, retime the signal so that it works more efficiently. And uh, that's a very important uh, aspect of this. It's the same aspect and recommendation that we made for the adjoining residential use uh, to this board. Uh, we want to know after the fact what reality is and, and, and adjust to it. Uh, the sidewalks were the other significant outcome and finding and recommendation, and uh, it sounds like the applicant is willing to pursue that. Uh, we think that uh, to, to live at this community, at this location, to have Pedestrian accommodation is fundamental, it's important, it's necessary, not only for bus activity and getting to a bus stop, uh, but to the other area land uses, to a restaurant, to a 99 restaurant, to the Dunkin' Donuts eventually up the street, uh, or the convenience stores across the street. The new bank down the street. Exactly, right. Um, you know, to the extent that those connections are made, it means that people don't have to get into their car. There are convenient ways to, to uh, rely on, on your feet instead. Uh, we, uh, we finally uh, suggested, and the applicant has, has provided uh, a comprehensive transportation demand management program. Uh, it's the same recommendation, again, that we suggested for the, uh, their neighbor. Uh, and the elements that uh, Mr. Dirk had pointed out are all uh, in line with traditional TDM measures that apply to resident, uh, residential projects and, and have proven to be uh, effective in uh, at least uh, alerting people that there are options other than an automobile to get from point A to point B. Uh, so with that, uh, we find that uh, 
you know, their work was comprehensive, professional, and um, you know, uh, they're satisfied. <clears throat> you didn't find anything in there that gave you a hard time. No, no, and uh, you know, I think to the extent. Uh, you know, signals are talked about at Robbins Row. We don't see that the volumes would, would trigger the need for that. And, uh, in fact, implementing that form of control would probably complicate traffic flow on, on one I was going to say, personally, I hate <laughs> to see it. Yeah, you and, know? you know, and, and really, you know, when, um, when the park was at its fullest occupancy, the 80,000 square feet, which is now being marketed, it's currently vacant, and the, the, uh, the building that's on this site today, uh, when those were at full tilt, um, I suspect that there were, you know, longer queues in the evening, not enough even under those circumstances to justify a signal, uh, and where they're reversing patterns in this case, um, you know, compared to history, I think that there will be, uh, you know, lower impact as a result of this project. So it's, it's a good use for, 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 uh, for that reason. It's complementary. Before we leave traffic, um, can I assume that you're going to bring us back eventually an internal traffic analysis? <clears throat> you look a little baffled. Yeah. When we approved another large project down on 110 uh, a few years back, they gave us flows of internal traffic that we were able to look at, offer some suggestions, we had a peer reviewer look at that too, and there were some issues uh, that were not originally correct in the uh, proponent's plan. Do you intend to give us internal traffic flow at all, analysis, or not? I think if it's important to the board, we're happy to acquiesce. Well, what, what is the. Yeah. <clears throat> what do you think we should say? It? Can. I mean, I, I, I I'm not familiar with the request. I don't yeah, I, we can develop a circulation plan that shows kind of how traffic circulates within the site, which I think is what you're looking okay. for. Yes. Well, well yeah. for, for example, and it wasn't Princeton's project, that back at the time I believe it was JPI's project, they had some islands with trees and this and that. And I think David was the one that kind of initially started it. There didn't seem to be enough space between parking here and parking there, emergency vehicles and so on and so forth. So. I think it's kind of important to see that stuff, but if the board doesn't, I see a lot of... Yeah, I think it's important. And Mr. Chair, if I might, um, and I failed to mention this, we did, and, and this is really in the purview of site plan more than, than traffic per se, but okay. um, we did point out that an auto turn analysis would be appropriate for the site to determine the feasibility of sweeping the site or using the aisles within the site to access buildings for emergency apparatus and I believe the applicant mentioned they we actually, may have, yeah. yeah we did a swept path analysis for the fire department so maybe that accomplishes the same goal here it, 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 it might but again I go back I, I think the other concern was that it was also awful tight even just for cars to pass one another the, the width between the two parking areas didn't seem to be you know, wide enough for a lot of comfort. Can, so I, 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 I'm not talking, you know, I don't know how the board feels, I'm not talking just about emergency vehicles, but even your own tenants. I think the board should have some idea as to the, you know, safety and, and flow of that traffic. We can accommodate the request, Mr. Chairman. We'll just we'll take care of it. Very good. The only other... I have a question, yeah, Jay. I just I had a question. Um, you know, if we find out that uh, the, a lot of the traffic is going to be going left instead of right, because mm -hmm. obviously it's easier to go right than left, right? How, so you think you'd be able to accommodate that through the signal timing, timing of the signals? Yeah. Yes. The um, I would refer to um, that type of exercise as a sensitivity analysis, right? We, we actually consider that when we look at an application, we know that traffic engineering is not um, a precise science uh, in, in that patterns of traffic tend to change depending on many variables. Uh, so the question we ask is, well, if the, the left turn volume goes up by 10, 20, you know, 30 vehicles, would that make a difference in the analysis? Would that trip something that ordinarily wouldn't be an issue? 
Um, the amount of traffic that's being generated as an outbound trip in this case when it splits at the driveway would result, as an example, in about 30 to 40 right turns per hour, right? And if, if that were 50 uh, or 60, it wouldn't materially affect what they presented for findings. Uh, and conversely, a left turn, right? So the left turn volume, if it was 10 or 20 or, or slightly even more than that, mm. uh, a higher volume, uh, would that be accommodated within the capacities of the system, the signals? Um, the answer is yes. At that range of activity, uh, that's well within the ebb and flow of normal day-to-day -day traffic on 110, uh, and that could be accommodated with how the signal reacts. Those are actuated signals, and they, they respond to, to traffic in that way. Um, but when taken in aggregate with other projects, like the residential project next door, uh, you know, this project, well, if they were off by 20 vehicles and they were off by 30 next door, all of a sudden, you know, that's 50 extra cars over the course of an hour. That could be enough to warrant a change in the way that the green time allocation works on the signal. Under any of those scenarios, we believe, uh, it's our opinion that you can work with the signal timings to to accommodate those type of trip increases okay so the the short answer is that the signal timing adjustments which would be an outcome of the monitoring process uh would would be appropriate and and meaningful in addressing that change in pattern because look with the residential of both projects then in the additional enlargement of the Littleton train station. Yes. I mean, they may, instead of opting to drive to Boston, may go to Littleton for, sure. for the train. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. There, always people may work in Boston want to go to the train, you yeah. know, instead of going right. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. There are external factors that could weigh against, you know, what those signal timings look like. Um, the ERA project, the, 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 the millions of dollars that was spent on 110, as a result of the, you know, it was the American Reinvestment Act, right, um, uh, really addressed the capacity issues and provide enough capacity over time that um, it, it, it can accommodate and adjust to those conditions within reason. Uh, it's not to say that if a mega development went in somewhere along the quarter that you wouldn't have to add lanes or do other structural improvements to address it. But within the realm of like a 10, 15-year period, assuming a certain reasonable amount of growth in the quarter, uh, the backfilling of space in this park, the development of these two projects, the completion of Orchard Square, normal area growth patterns, all of those can be accommodated by adjustment of those systems. They're fairly new systems. Um, I just I had a question for you, Bob, um, uh, and maybe for Jeff as well to weigh in. What if there are um, conflicting signal timing needs from each of these residential projects? Do we, what, what would what would we do? Yeah. So Mass DOT is the arbiter, right? They they uh, they own the stuff. So um, you know any changes that are made to that system are subject to a permit, right? And uh, and authorization of DOT and DOT's position, their policy, is to favor public way over private entrances. Right, so to the extent um, you needed to retime the Red Hat driveway, for instance, and add green time to that driveway, there's a point at which that begins to affect the amount of delay that occurs on 110. DOT is going to put a cap on how much green time that driveway would, would receive. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter from their perspective. Who's waiting? <laughs> Correct, right. They, they don't want the public to wait. But if you're coming out of a private driveway, you know, hey, tough luck. <laughs> I mean, that's the way it goes. So, so there, they'll be the arbiter of that. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, and then just to follow up, I just thank you for mentioning the Littleton train station, and this is really to both applicants. Um, the it's like two miles from this site to the Littleton train station. The Fitchburg line had uh, eight million dollars worth of um, double tracking improvements. We now have outbound trains that get uh, I think there are three trains that get there before nine in the morning so for reverse commute folks who are willing to ride the commuter rail that actually is kind of a viable um, way to get out to this general area um, and the other thing I would just suggest to the board um, 
is that Westford is in two transportation management associations. We have Cross Sound Connect and we have the Middlesex 3 TMA. Um, and I think it might be um, an additional TDM measure to require participation in those groups, um, require being a member. Those groups are actively working, for example, on shuttles that will go to the Littleton train station from all the way up at Juniper um, Networks in the, the eastern part of one town <coughs> um, towards the train station. You know, these both of these developments would be an ideal stop. Um, they have to participate financially in that. Um, and so it's not simple, but by being a member of these TMAs, um, in addition to the, the features that are part of the um, Mass Rides pro program, you really get more services. You get somebody who's going to work with the um, uh, manager to make sure that they know about initiatives that are going on, to do Earth Day presentations to their residents, to um, you know, uh, create excitement about Bike to Work Week or whatever it is. But um, there, there are really some additional benefits. Um, in particular that these TMAs um, will work on and they generally are private sector driven. Um, we have two different kinds of TMAs here in Westford but um, and the, uh, the Middlesex 3 is kind of oriented to people who are traveling down um, you know uh, middle um, route 3 uh, cross town connects is a little bit more to the uh, west and to the south. So those are just the things I wanted to add. Well, um, <clears throat> and listening about all this signalization you know, we have one project here that's going to do their signalization. We've got another project here that's going to do their signalization. It seems to me that we need to have one boss who's going to decide who gets what and where and why. Um, that's one comment. And the second comment is Concord Road has always been um, kind of an issue because there's a tremendous amount of people who use that as a who's Westford as a cut through. And 110, um, feel confident, has the capacity, but Concord, Lane, Concord Road is a two-lane road. And I think there's going to be problems because the chair lives on Concord Road. If it backs up past his house, <laughs> I think you got big problems. <laughs> so, I mean, is... Uh, if it gets that bad, I'm yeah, moving. <laughs> I mean, is, is there enough capacity there that, or uh, the way the lights are going to be timed to make sure that all this works? I mean, that's a... I, again, I point back to DOT. Um, those those signals are actually coordinated signals, right? They're, they're, they're a set of three signals, right? So there's Concord Road West, Red Hat, and Concord Road East, mm -hmm. right? And they all work on the same cycle length. Um, they're coordinated to allow for progressive traffic flow along Littleton Road. If you n make a change to one, you need to be cognizant of its effect to the others, right? So um, you actually have four there because you got uh, down by the the um, Bell Beef Road, Powers Road, Road too. Right, yeah. right. Um, so those those are part of a system. Okay. Uh, DOT controls that system. They 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 will um, to the extent any changes are made to one of those as part of the system, there needs to be a systems analysis. Right. So you can't just arbitrarily add 10 seconds of green time here and, and forget about the other location. So um, the way that um, I, I see this being structured is that you have uh, two separate applicants that may be on two separate time frames uh, in terms of when they actually come online, how many units are, are in play at the time. Um, right now, I know the, the neighbor to this project is uh, – you know, it, at least it's suggested that they conduct their monitoring to include to include the Concord Road East uh, location and the Red Hat location. So there's an overlap of the Red Hat signal, mm -hmm. and then you've got this applicant that would be obligated for looking at that signal in Concord Road West. Um, when you say obligated, you're talking about the expense the, involved. The expense of actually conducting the turning movement okay. counts and evaluating at that time mm -hmm. whether or not an adjustment to those signal timings would be necessary to to have them work better. Um, you know, it's almost a self-regulating thing. So, you know, to the extent their neighbor is up and running quicker and they do the monitoring first, you know, they would be obligated to make those changes at that time. And, and conversely, if this developer moved quicker than they did, then they would be in that same position of, of suggesting improvements, getting those done and, and approved through DOT. Uh, you know, there is overlap, um, but uh, that's not a bad thing. You know, it, it, there's kind of two bites to the apple, if you will, to make adjustments on perhaps two separate occasions to make sure that those patterns are being accommodated properly. 
in, in either case, DOT is the arbiter. You know, you don't—they're they're the boss, so to speak. And they'll entertain proposals from individual uh, applicants, if you will. And is this, from this board's perspective, there's conditioning this, and as we speak, as these two possibilities you just mentioned, Bob. Going forward, DOT being, I assume, a state bureaucracy like Rostar, you know, we end up with something coming online and, and see firsthand, visually, these issues. How long does it take DOT to do yeah. this, to factor in these two projects? To, are we going to have traffic jams for six months before this survey and timing issue gets resolved? No. Or is this something that can be done expeditiously? See, th these are fairly, th this, th there are um, traffic signal control permits that are granted for, in this case, a system that would identify what the computer settings should be uh, at, at each location. Um, if an applicant were to um, request that that be changed, you know, uh, there would need to be a functional design report that would, would uh, describe why okay. and what those changes entail, right? So they would take a timing chart that says, you know, uh, Littleton Road gets this much time now with, under our proposed condition, it will get this much. Uh, DOT would then review that as part of an application uh, and presumably, you know, they comment or, or approve uh, that change prior to it actually being implemented. But that timeline is not a long timeline. It's not like okay. building a new signal. Okay. Uh, it's, it's, it's almost really just a maintenance uh, type action. New scheduling can it, software. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. where a, a new signal could take upwards of a year to actually permit. Uh, those types of changes of signal timing adjustment are done in weeks, okay. not 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 months. And not to belabor the issue, but and and that interaction between DOT is between DOT and the applicant. Correct. Yes. Correct. So how how many times would the applicant and DOT? Or I guess because there probably would be some timing on this, right? You wouldn't want to do it too quickly, or well, we, you need to have some. We're suggesting, you know two-thirds of the development be okay. occupied so that there's a critical mass and there's a established pattern. Uh, so, you know, as opposed to waiting until the entire uh, project is occupied, you could be waiting for a while for that to happen, and there might be something that needs to be addressed in the meantime. So we find generally as a rule that about two-thirds of occupancy that provides a sufficient critical mass uh, and established pattern in which to make a change if one is necessary. Uh, and uh, we've suggested the same for the neighbor. The, 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 um, the applicant's going to post-monitor traffic. How long does that monitoring go on for? So like say the end of Robbins Road, the 80,000 square feet, that's not leased right now. Right doesn't get leased for two or three years. And then that happens to change the whole pattern. Who goes to DOT at that point, the town? Um, to the extent there's an issue that, that could be, well, it, it could be a town issue. Um, as a practical matter, uh, you know, if the economy hopefully, you know, holds right. on a little bit. Um, that I'm saying worst case scenario. Yeah. W worst case is they occupy, um, the patterns are a little bit different than they are today. Right. Uh, there may not be a need to adjust timing. Right. Uh, but if there was because of that occupancy now in the back, yeah. does that fall back to the town? That, uh, ultimately it would, but okay. I think there's enough flexibility in the way that the controllers are set that um, it wouldn't break day one. Wouldn't the, op wouldn't the op op occupancy of those potential have to do the same thing you're doing now, now. they're already they're established the buildings they're, they're, they're not buildings. subject to permits at that yeah. point but but in, yeah. in general I, I think one thing I would throw out is there are a lot of conditions you put in a project where you need to hold their feet to the fire because there's going to be a, an impact on the town and not on the site right this is different any kind of impact here is sort of on them too you know they're going to want to cure the problem right around their site right. because they're trying to you know, these are their tenants right I mean, they're probably going to feel it most strongly. So we, we I do think this. Agree with Mr. Glenn, mm -hmm. it's, we're going to operate the site. We're in town now. We're not going anywhere. We're going to be here for a while. Um, if our residents can't get out in the morning and we can address it with a simple updated traffic study, it counts and, and reset the, the, the lights. We're going to do that and would work collaborative, collaboratively with the town to, to get that done. Yeah. Uh, well, just to mention, any, any consideration of, you know, traffic going West Kimball's seasonally impact, you know, five or six o'clock, there seems to be a lot of people on three or four months of the year going there, mm -hmm. coming from there. Mm -hmm. And that's grown every, seems like 18 months, we get another 
request from them to add something to that whole operation <laughs> there. Is that any, talk about Archard Square, but that's another 500 yards up the road. Yeah, it's, it's you know, um, traffic is not a precise science, as I mentioned yeah. before, and uh, there are <laughs> seasonal factors or weather-related factors. Um, it, uh, the economy drives what these patterns look like to some, to some degree. Um, the process that the applicant has used to evaluate impacts um, takes today's known traffic volume conditions and it actually uh, grows it and projects it out seven years from now uh, to accommodate um, other area growth that wasn't specifically identified as, for instance, Orchard Square. And that growth factor that they've used in here um, to a large uh, extent offsets those ebbs and flows in traffic that you mentioned. Uh, you know, like July uh, versus November. Exactly, yeah. and you know, case in point, uh, they did their counts in December. December happens to be, based on regional counts, uh, a lower than average month. So they made an adjustment for that. Okay. They increased the volumes by about nine percent above actual volumes that they counted, okay. uh, and that itself would, uh, you know, mm -hmm. uh, address the types of issues that you point out. And on top of that, they've looked at a seven-year growth pattern. They've added volume for that, and they've added volume for the Orchard Square and the backfilling of the space. So uh, we think that what they've done is, is certainly consistent with an industry standard. Um, it, you know, it, it's, it's not like counting chocolates on a factory ma machine. It, you know, there are ebbs and flows to this, and uh, the way that the infrastructure is designed, in this case the signals that operate along 110, is they're designed to accommodate that ebb and flow in traffic. The controller has minimum and maximum settings for green time that it, it, it allows to float depending on what that actual demand is. So uh, on a given typical weekday, you might find that you, you need 40 seconds of green time to get everyone going and through the queue. Uh, and uh, But the controller has the ability to process maybe 10 seconds more green time if it needs it for the, ev the eventuality of a Kimball scenario. Mm -hmm. So there is some flexibility in the system. Okay. Uh, and uh, they're shock absorbers, if you will, for the demand that ebbs and flows from the Thank you. <coughs> Question. I just, um, so as uh, Ezra pointed out, or somebody pointed out, um, we do have um, traffic, internal circulation, I think, which is the request from the board. And generally that is, um, as Mr. Pesnola pointed out with the, their sweep analysis, can be done in the civil and site plan review. Um, and I think, you know, Bob, unless, you know, Bob can obviously take a look at that, but he looked at the auto turn analysis. And so just kind of wrapping up on the traffic, if the board has any more questions on traffic, you can also, you know, we can always ask Bob, you know, if you have a question next month, um, you can do that. But um, it might be time to go to the civil engineering, um, given the hour. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, do you mind if I ask a quick question to the applicant? Just sure. so. Of everything we discussed and the peer review sub, there were no proposed conditions that you had any problem with, right? They all made sense to you? That's correct. Okay, that's right. Thanks. Thank you. I would, oh, before we shift gears, and maybe this will come up with the civil, but I, I neglected to point out, um, the chair, Mr. Chairman, you had, had uh, inquired, and as, as the fire department did as well, to create pedestrian access from our site to Red Hat. And that's now incorporated into the plan. So we have, I just want to make sure that the board was aware of that. So we have the pedestrian, we locate a spot that we can create the pedestrian access from our site into to the property line into Red Hat. Oh, thank you. I was eventually going to get to that. So that's, that's done. <laughs> yes. Beautiful. Good evening, Mr. Chairman, um, members of the board. For the record, Joe Pesnola from Hancock Associates. Um, we um, have been busy over the, since the last meeting. We have responded to the fire department com comments uh, in the letter of, of um, February 14th. As uh, Mr. Endike said, we did have a meeting with um, Lieutenant Parsons on March 24th and went over all of his, his concerns and addressed those uh, to the board in a, in a letter dated April 4th, of 2017. The, the major uh, I think the major point of uh, that meeting was the site access. And we looked at three scenarios. Uh, one was uh, uh, an access point to in, the, in the south in the south west corner 
um, going down to the, the rest of the office park. And that was discounted just because it was it was going to be problematic. It was going to be steep, and Lieutenant Parsons just didn't feel it was it was worth um, everything that would have had to go go through to to establish that. The second was to develop two full full functioning entrances uh, on Robbins, and I think the the one to the closest to Littleton Road began to look problematic from the standpoint of impacting that queue, impacting the circulation, impacting the, the split with the, uh, with the dedicated lanes getting uh, exiting the site. So ultimately the third choice was, was, uh, was chosen um, with, with Lieutenant Parsons' uh, uh, acquiescence, and that is uh, a, an emergency-only entrance on that end uh, that's now shown uh, in grass pave. So we'll establish an area, establish a compacted base, we'll put down the, the, the reinforcing mat, and then backfill that with, uh, with, with uh, uh, low material and, and actually establish grass. So aesthetically, it, it'll, it'll be uh, nice. But that will be maintained, <coughs> free of vegetation, kept, kept free of uh, snow in the winter, and be a, a functioning entrance or exit for the fire department and emergency vehicles. We also went through um, the site itself and and did a, a, the swept path analysis for the 100-foot uh, uh, ladder truck and proved to the fire department. Thank you, Jeffrey. And proved to the fire department we can get their fire truck every place it needs to go uh, throughout the site. Uh, additionally, we. They, they were looking at accessing from all of those points that we could get to with their ladder the upper floors of the um, of the, the, resi the taller residential units. We found that the, the greatest distance from a, from a, a place where the fire truck needed to position itself to the to a, a particular window is 90 feet. That, that window, that sill is 32 feet high. So we've proved to him with some geometry that we can get that 100-foot ladder to that to that most remote access point. So I think Lieutenant Parsons is satisfied that we can get around the site and we can fully comply with the regulations for for that access. We went through a, a, a lot of uh, smaller items, such as just pedest uh, man access to the sprinkler rooms, uh, conflicts with fire hydrants and parked vehicles. And we've made all of those changes that the fire department wanted to uh, to, to address those those minor issues uh, that we out outline in that April fourth correspondence. I think we definitely got that that end of the the project review in a very good position. So we've submitted that we've su along with the swept path analysis. And as we said, we can take that same computer software that, that did that analysis and look at passenger vehicles and look at it more um, not from the standpoint of the, the big sweep of the trucks, but can the cars coexist and in going in two directions. And we, we feel we're, we're in very good shape there. Our, our curb radii are, are quite large. We have 24 foot wide aisles in, in all places except one. Uh, which is just the, the backup area to the townhouses in that lower corner. Um, and that, that area is only being used for the emergency vehicles to, to do the, the backup maneuver to get out of the site. It's really not accessing any parking spaces or um, for, for the residents. Additionally, we had uh, we received a, a letter from Ty and Bond, your peer review engineer, dated April 17th. And the MDM letter of April 13th, in which Mr. Misho did have some site-related comments. So what, we're pre what we've presented to the board dated April 20th is a, is a response, point-by-point -point response to, to both of those letters. I think, by and large, it's, it's a lot of uh, detail, some questions on our, cal on our stormwater calculations, some questions on some details within the site itself. We've addressed all those and presented to the board a, a full revision to our, our plans 
uh, addressing that. Now, I've just given that to you tonight uh, and to your consultant tonight, so I would, uh, I would expect that there's time needed to, to digest that, to review and to, and, and to corroborate that we've actually addressed all of the points within that. Um, with regard to that pedestrian connection point, Down here, we provided a, a striped out area um, between the two, two uh, small garages. Uh, a striped out area within the parking lot and then a, a small pedestrian connection point. We reworked the grades in there so that they work with the existing grades at, at the property line so that they'll be uh, soft and ADA accessible. And then that will provide that linkage through the Red Hat site and up to that, um, to that intersection. Very good. So we have also presented a revision to the stormwater report um, to, to both the board and, and your consultant with, uh, with some of those changes. So I'm happy, happy to answer any questions on the status of the civil and look forward to continuing to work with, with your peer review consultant. Any questions at this time? Thank you very much. <coughs> um, may I just, um, just for the record, Joe, and I'm just, you know, seeing the packet, and it looks like you, you keep re you were referencing an April 4th letter, which is the board. Did we just receive this today, or was that submitted? It doesn't look like it got onto the correspondence sheet. So we can work with you and do some, make sure that we have official um, documents. I mean, obviously, this is being submitted into the record today. Um, the turn analysis, I don't know if that's part. Is, was it? Okay. So. Yeah. One letter from Mount okay. Engineering. If it all came in Thursday, so we'll just I would just let the board know we're you know as we do with these big projects we're carefully kind of tracking the correspondence make sure that everything's in the record that needs to be in the record yeah. and just want to acknowledge it doesn't seem like everything's here and we'll update this we for can, the board at their next yeah, meeting. Make sure that is but the swept path analysis is an attachment to the April fourth letter. Right, and that's and, why. We, and yes, there was one other correspondence that that was attached to um, to our letter. And that was in response to a, a comment from Ty and Vaughn with regards to proving out that we have the wastewater treatment capacity in, in the adjoining plant. Um, Princeton has engaged Mount Hope Engineering to do the design of the upgrades to that plant. Mm -hmm. And they did a, a full investigation and provided a letter uh, dated April 20th that says that the plant is working at a capacity of 39,000 gallons per day. It's, it's got a, a permit, a groundwater discharge permit from Mass DEP for 39,000 gallons. The, the plant design is for 80,000 gallons. Uh, it, was, it, it was basically constructed in a manner for the 80,000. The effluent field was put in for 80,000. The actual tankage um, in supporting the um, plant is in at 80,000, and the building itself, ha it's an it's uh, an RBC unit, or it's ultimately going to be two RBC units. One RBC unit was installed, and there's a skid position for the second one. So literally, all we have to do is put that second RBC unit in. And then, then open some valving to, to have all of the tankage work, and we're we're good for 80. Now we do have to uh, permit that with DEP as a modification of the groundwater discharge permit, because the permit was actually issued for the 40, um, but the design was the design and, and as I said, much of the implementation was was done at 80. You just answered my second question, but I'll go back to the first question. Uh, through your agreement, is that something that you people are in charge of or the owner of the plant? Permitting. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a shared um, agreement. So we will uh, pay, pay our fair share in the operation and maintenance of the plant going forward once we tie in. Mm -hmm. We have a tie-in connection agreement uh, with the current ownership group. Um, and it's, fair, it's a 
as simple as that, I think. Yeah, okay. And at the DEP side, in the modification of the groundwater, groundwater discharge permit, they will they will want they will demand that we provide all that legal doc documentation that ties those parties together, and make sure that the entity that is responsible for it has the power to um, to make sure that that happens. It, it will be one entity that that maintains and operates, but other parties are. are you may, want to, you may want to think of it as a condominium association. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'll both, uh, current owner and us will become members of that association to maintain it. And as Joe said, it has to go through the DEP for approval. Okay. Is there a, 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 a lifespan on this agreement? Um, it would be the duration of the project. I mean, it, I mean, it would be, it wouldn't end. Just want to know. <laughs> yeah, when, uh, when Ten years from now, they may raise the ante, and you guys will say, "What are we going to do now?" Uh, uh, our attorneys have uh, covered that. Okay. <laughs> All right. Any other questions, Paul? All right. I see none. Um, thank you. Um, can were you happy uh, with you for this piece? Yes, I was. And then just. I thought you looked familiar. Well, I mean, just for the board's benefit, we, we've tried as much as possible to have some back and forth between the applicants, consultants, and the peer reviews. So ideally to smooth things out before they get to you so you don't have to sit here and be referee while they bicker about this number or that number. And I think like, we're hoping is people can come. Well, I think, yeah. I, I, think, I think this board had said that early on. Yeah, exactly. We exactly. want them to do that. We allow them to do that. And so for the record, I'm Jean Christie with Ty and Bond out in Westfield. Um, as was mentioned, I did just receive this today, the, the response to comments and revised plans and stormwater report. Um, but just a couple points about my review. I uh, reviewed the site plans and stormwater report in compliance or for compliance with your local bylaws and the Massachusetts stormwater standards. Um, in general, I did not see much, any, many real concern with the stormwater management system. There was some technical things, but we were gonna work through those. Um, there were a couple items that I expect that I will be requesting that the board consider the conditions. Um, a couple, of, so for example, um, there will be a soil testing component prior to construction that will need to see the soil. Potential fencing around basins, and this may be a little more of a discussion. Um, at this time, the basin at Robbins Road, which is you know, right at the entrance to the property, <coughs> is unfenced, or it will not be fenced. Um, I'm not proposing to include a fence there. My feeling is that since there's kids around, and kids are kids, they get into things. Um, but I do understand and that it's their front door, so it's the first thing that people are gonna see when you drive again. Um, so that's something I'm gonna ask you to consider and think about as I move forward with my review. Um, same thing with fencing on walls. Fencing on walls isn't required, but kids jump off of walls. So just something to throw out there for your consideration. Um, you know, I, I see responses about the wastewater treatment. That's fantastic. Um, I will review all of this revised information in depth over the next couple of days to get a letter back to you folks um, with any other findings and final recommendations. Um, and again, the stormwater, there was technical things that I'm not going to bore anybody with at this time. So are there any other questions? I don't have a question as yet, but I do want to make a statement, and I'm not sure whether it was you or the other applicant that's due up after you, but um, as one member of the board, I thought I made it pretty clear that fencing was something that was very important because I happen to agree with that peer review as far as kids go and stuff like that. I mean, they have a tendency to climb, um, you know, detention areas and retention ponds and stuff like that, and even maybe even these some of these walls. So you need to give serious consideration, in my opinion, to. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, first of all, I don't think it was us um, that you made the okay. comment to. Okay. Well, I'm, I, um, I wasn't sure. I know that it was. But then it was the other applicant. The same. Um, <clears throat> we'll look into it, and we'll try to find common ground on that, and see if we can do something that's aesthetically, you know, acceptable, and that, that meets the. We want, we want the area to be safe. Okay. Other questions? Okay. Seeing none. Thank you.
Mr. Chair, are you ready to hear about your next meeting date and the kind of topics that we might look for, or did you guys um, want to talk about things before I get, get there? Well, I suspect we probably will do it on the uh, 22nd of May. Correct. You're continuing with these special meetings. Um, so the fourth Monday is um, uh, like today. And uh, what in your packet you have a list that actually Ezra prepared that kind of tried to, you know, um, show what we were anticipating. And this is the kind of list that gets updated as we go through the process. So I heard the applicant say architecture. Um, will happen at the next meeting on the 22nd, so we'll add that. Um, we'll move that up. Um, we have, I think it's not necessarily traffic per se, but internal circulation, parking, emergency wow, access with the civil. We'll continue with that. Yes, no, Ezra's pretty good, isn't he? Um, we've got the follow up that Gene just mentioned on the materials that were received tonight for um, civil, civil details like stormwater management, uh, wastewater treatment. Obviously, we continue to always follow up on things that you ask us. Um, and then I wanted to check with you, Dan. Did you say fiscal impact analysis? Because we don't have it yet. So you, you don't have it. We haven't engaged it yet. Uh, okay. But I think our intention when talking with Mr. Morissette was to try to get that done between now and the next hearing. And we'll work in good faith to try to accommodate that. Okay. If we can get it, it's not a it's not a tall task. I think once we engage the party to do it, it's probably a 10-day turnaround. And so if we can get that done and then give Ezra okay. enough time to get a peer reviewed prior to the 22nd of May, we'd like to do that. Okay. Uh, but so, so we'll put fiscal impact as well, but kind of keep it on the, maybe keep it on the following meeting as well. So, so I, guess, I guess the other thing that I would ask the board, um, whether or not it's premature, uh, I think sooner rather than later, we ought to come to some agreement number of units and architecture, architecture and whether or not we can cross that off our list um, maybe not tonight if you're not prepared but I think you know I think probably by the next meeting um, I think we ought to consider at least wrapping up those two items mm -hmm. okay <clears throat> um, I guess that's uh, about it then yeah. Mr. Chair, one final comment. Mm -hmm. we, uh, just so you know, and it wasn't a forgotten comment that you had made at the last hearing, is our, our architect is looking into a slight redesign to the cars to make it more colonial. The roof. So that we were on that. Appreciate it. Thank you. And um, we do need a motion uh, and to continue to May 22nd. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. <clears throat> Agenda is Concord Road residents at West recycling bin was continued from April nineteenth without discussion. So, this agenda is a month behind. I just saw an email. This agenda is a month behind. That's a sport. Yeah, I mean, that's a sport. So, right? Hey, DJ. See number three? Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, for the record, my name is Israel Lopez with the Guitarist yeah. Company. Yeah. Um, just to quickly introduce uh, the team that I'm here with tonight, uh, Paul Alfin uh, and our fiscal impact consultant, Paul uh, Sweet, as well as uh, William Park from Sims Maney. Uh, First of all, I'd like to just uh, thank the board for accommodating our schedule on this evening's uh, agenda, uh, recognizing that um, the hour is late and we'll try and be efficient uh, and um, move through the materials as quickly as we can. It was a, uh, a very 
good request in light of what happened at our meeting last Wednesday night. We'll have to watch the tape. Quarter of 11. So, Mr. Chair, I'm not sure the applicant was here when we um, uh, just let the board know that we have Mr. Michaud here um, from the other hearing, and if there were any outstanding comments or questions for the traffic engineer, we know you don't have yours here tonight, but um, he's here, and so we just want to allow the board Chance and, and, and he, wouldn't, you a he chance. wouldn't have to wait yeah. during the entire meeting. Yeah. Are so there any questions for Bob Mitchell with regards to traffic on this particular project? Uh, Seems to be piggybacking off the last one. Yeah. <laughs> mm. uh, hang on just a second there. Any concerns uh, with regards to traffic? Uh, from our standpoint? Yes. Yeah. From our, yeah, as far as our peer reviewer. No, I think we um, uh, we addressed all of the um, points at our last um, uh, hearing and correspondence, and um, uh, have addressed those in the responses to the to their review. Okay, thank you, Robin. Thank you very much. Have a good night. Good job. <laughs> so I know we uh, provided a fair amount of information. Um, uh, over the course since our last hearing um, and uh, I guess I will leave it to the board to um, um, decide which which item they'd like for us to uh, respond to well let me start by saying um, the main items again as I say I, I didn't get this till around two o'clock but I did I did go through most of it, and it seems as though the biggest outstanding items or issues right now are both with the police and fire with regards to certain calculations. Um, there was some communication on school children, but that didn't seem to be as blatant as police and fire issue goes, um, manpower-wise and so on and so forth. And, and there was um, <coughs> contradictory remarks between, I think it was you and our peer reviewer, I'm not sure, so. Yeah, yeah. so that, um, um, why don't we uh, sort of take the um, uh, police uh, comments first, mm -hmm. um, and I believe those were with respect to the fiscal impact report. Right, and the numbers and calls. And the numbers and calls, yeah, et cetera. Right. And uh, we did follow up. Um, we just received that uh, report on Thursday, I believe it was, uh, or Wednesday rather, and we responded. So um, uh, obviously, you, you haven't had a you know uh, appropriate time to review. And we sent um, some comments back addressing those. Uh, and maybe what I'll let uh, what I'll do is I'll let um, our peer uh, or our um, fiscal impact consultant address uh, those comments. Please. Good evening. For the record, Lynn Sweet, LDS Consulting Group, and I'm from Newton, Massachusetts. All the way, half an hour away. Um, so, I, I just wanted to see: Did any of you receive the April 20th um, response memo? Um, it was addressed to the chair, and it did go bullet by bullet um, mm -hmm. through the comments that were raised by. Um, by Captain Mark Chambers, and and if not, um, some of it lies lies on me. Quite frankly, there are a couple typos in there, and I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed. I had a misplaced two in a couple of places. Don't be. Hmm? Don't be. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you. So it was sitting at your excuse me. It was sitting at your place tonight. Um, oh, the hard copies, go. and I think you got it by go. you know, by email um, last week. But the, the hard copies are right should be right in front of you. Yep. Um, I guess the first thing I can do is assure you that in spite of my typos, the calculations that I did and the results that I gave you were uh, were correct. Um, so the first question um, that um, Captain Chambers raised was with regard to the number of police calls. And I had uh, stated in my report 2,822 in reality um, that 
number was um, I had uh, I had um, dropped dropped uh, a number from that and, and it should be I'm looking at that it should be 2008 uh, 28,222 and that is exactly what my calculations were and I did attach to this document um, the police call log um, as exhibit one which was emailed to me um, by um, by Gregory Johnson and um, so since he emailed it to me and it was a PDF I actually took every single police call log line that's in here put it into an Excel and added it up mm -hmm. so the information that I got did come from the municipal municipality the calculations did reflect the 28,222 um, it just uh, was missing the last two um, the uh, next item um, that he um, suggested was that I was incorrect in saying that the majority of the calls were medical calls, and he was absolutely right. Um, the records that I have um, correspond with his, and I have taken that comment out of the fiscal impact analysis. That was really something that relates a lot more to fire than it does to police. Um, the next comment was with uh, regard to the cost per call and the costs pertaining to public <coughs> safety budgeting benefits and so on. So there's kind of kind of a lot tied into that one particular uh, paragraph. Um, and um, I uh, received um, information from um, the finance director, Mr. Dan O'Donnell. Um, back in February when I did this work um, and he um, suggested that for personnel there were 48 police officers and 12 dispatch which totals 60 so when I actually calculated my benefits I actually calculated all 60 staff at a blended rate of 17,000 per person for benefits on top of salaries and that number that 17,000 per person was also something that I discussed at length um, with uh, Mr. O'Donnell um, and so um, in addition to uh, the benefits I also added in half of the salaries for the new communication center because it's my understanding that's going to staff half fire and half police so I did include salaries and benefits um, salaries for 60 people and benefits um, for all 60 as well as um, communication center um, salaries so at the end of the day my police budget was 6.3 million and change um, and that equated to two, $224 a call um, based on the number of calls in the call log that we received um, Police um, Chief Chambers. Um, Before you go any further, yeah, he's not the police chief; he's a captain. So you've got a few typos in here. Okay. I don't think he's got the pay grade yet. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm sorry, Captain Chambers um, had stated that the budget was only 4.8 million. So if I used his numbers, my per call cost would actually go down to 172. So my 224 is 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 a higher number than what he's suggesting. Um, and I think he didn't probably just didn't have the benefit of the of, of the backup and hasn't you know spent as much time as, as I have on this so I do feel very comfortable with the 224 per call uh, number which is what I used to come up with the uh, yearly increase in cost to the police department um, and that really actually also goes to his next comment about what you know how did I come up with the 224 um, per unit and that was really based on budget information that we talked about that the budget um, included um, both salaries um, and um, and benefits um, I took out a very small amount I believe that that they collect in fees and I divided it by the 28,222 in calls to get to my 224 per call um, and the next call uh, the next comment and this actually came up both in, in a couple of places was with regard to how many units there are at Avalon and I think I finally figured out where the confusion is there's actually three buildings and three separate assessors cards 
So each building has 28 units. And so if you just looked on the assessor's record and you only looked at the first card, you would see, oh, there's only 28 units, but there's three of them if you hit next, next, next. So hopefully that solves that there are indeed 84 units at um, Avalon um, here in town. And so that I do believe that our, our calculations are correct. But I, it was nice to, because it kept coming up, it was bugging me. Why did this keep coming up? So hopefully that's something. Um, so my calculations do, um, do include 80, 84 units um, at Avalon for, with regard to trying to divide how many police or fire calls or school-aged children and so on. Um, the, the next item that came up was uh, with regard to the, um, the actual amount when I take my $224 per call and I multiply that by the estimated number of calls, my errant two showed up showing uh, two, um, 247000 and it should have been the 47000 as as um, the captain pointed out. And that 47000 is in my summary table. It's just in the body of the report. That, that extraneous two showed up again. Um, and just a, just a quick question yeah. before you finish on that. Yeah. Do you have any idea of where he come up with the 293 calls? I didn't see anything. 290. Let me just Well, in ahead. that same, you were just talking about your calculations of the 247 as opposed to 47. Wait, it's a paragraph above. He, he said, said, furthermore, yeah. the estimate should be applied to an average of 293 instead of 211. Do yeah, you have any so idea? It's based off of if you take the, um, if 84. you assume that Avalon only yeah. has 28 units instead of 84, and you look at the number of calls that came in from Avalon, it's going to look like the multiplier is a lot greater. So if there's only 24 units but you had 100 calls, it looks like your multiplier is bigger than it actually was. When So because there are actually 84 units, um, the yeah. multiplier is, is, is smaller. So lower. if he would have taken that multiplier and then applied it to our number of units, he would have gotten to 293. Okay, thank you. No, no, it just, it's, it's a good question again. We've probably been poring over these, you know. We're looking at one thing and you're looking at many. Um, so the last comment was generally, um, have I taken into consideration um, the specific properties in town because multifamily housing is going to have more phone calls than a single family home. And um, indeed, we did try and look at what we thought were the three most on point properties in town, which were Abbott Mill, Avalon Westford, and Princeton properties, because they were multifamily. They weren't age restricted, they weren't 100% affordable. So I do feel um, pretty comfortable with the numbers in, that are in the report outside of those couple of errant, errant twos which have now come out in, in the um, document that we sent along. And I did take the line out about um, the medical calls. And hopefully um, the captain will have a, a chance to, to look at this. Um, and um, I don't know if, I know your yes. peer reviewer is here, and I don't know if she's had it on this particular point. I don't know if it's appropriate for me to ask if she's had a chance to look at it either. Yes, yes. Please, come on up and... Good evening. Good evening. Um, my name is Roberta Cameron, and I'm with Community Opportunities Group based in Boston. Um, so I also had a chance to look at this memo, and I concur that the math is generally correct in, in the analysis. Um, they um, used the most recent, um, or the, the most relevant comparable um, sites that, that, are, that relate to the proposed development. Um, so the, the, the data, I think, is generally appropriately applied and, and accurate. Um, and I, I, I was satisfied that they answered the, the, um, the police captain's questions. And in general, the analysis, uh, the, with regards to the public safety costs, it's important to understand that unlike school costs, the, a new development is not going to have a, a direct 
one-to-one -one impact on cost. The, the resources, the staffing, and the equipment provided by the department is, is a budgeting decision that's made regardless of the amount of development. The new development that the town is seeing in general is contributing to a need for more resources um, to serve this area. This development is only contributing <coughs> to a small part of that. So what I'm concerned about is to see whether the, um, whether the methodology that uh, the proponents used to estimate the police and fire cost is commensurate with the scale of this development, and it seems to me that it is um, with respect to the police and fire. And we had some back and forth about the school costs, um, and the school projections are a reasonable range given what um, the town has experienced with other developments and what we've seen with other developments in the region. Um, the higher end of the range may be anticipated, um, but it is still there, there are developments in the area um, that have a lower number of school children, so it's possible that it could be um, anywhere within that range. Um, and with school costs, we had some back and forth relating to which um, average cost figure is appropriate to apply um, based on data from the Department of Education. And we concur that the analysis used the appropriate cost figure. Okay. Why wouldn't we use the actual cost that the school department knows? The, the average cost uh, that the town currently pays includes some cost of overhead and administration that doesn't increase with every additional school child. So the, um, the amount that's added per additional school child is something <coughs> below the straight average cost. So it's appropriate to use the, um, the required average spending per pupil based on the Chapter 70 funding formula. And that, what, that is what was used in the analysis. So with the, the, um, the town is obligated to meet the required minimum spending per pupil. <coughs> and that's the amount that's been um, assumed in this projection. Um, two things. I was, I was quite surprised by your memo to uh, actually Israel, April 11th where you say, while growth may be driving a need for additional public safety resources, and you just said it again, this development alone contributes a small share of the overall growth that is occurring. That kind of boggled my mind in light of what <coughs> um, police was saying and fire was saying and whatever. And certainly I don't want to accuse either one of them of, of crying wolf. But, um, you know, and I understand they need to take into consideration everything, but it just boggled my mind that you don't seem to think that there is as much of an impact by this project as police and fire are saying there is. By this project alone, I understand that this area is, has experienced a lot of development and additional development is planned in this area. So the concern about the need for staff um, is real, but one development alone, I, I, all of the development together is contributing to yeah. that. One development alone is not the one that's tipping the balance. Under, under, understood. And the second thing that was uh, at least eye-opening, I guess, and, and Scott is the one that uh, has, has pounded on this project since the original Princeton was done, um, in, in one of your reports, um, there is a, a range of school age children or impact, if you will. And I believe their high is a 65 and your low was a 65. Um, so in, in light of being midway between your estimates, um, you still don't believe that there is going to be that significant an impact on the school system. So the town has recently um, obtained a, a, a general fiscal impact analysis prepared by another consulting firm, RKG Associates. And the purpose of that analysis was to 
generate some reasonable estimates of what the town could expect from development of this type. And that, uh, that analysis um, used some inputs that are uh, more general than, than are applicable to this specific development. So we l looked at the, um, the range that would have been projected using the town's recent fiscal impact analysis compared with this fiscal impact analysis and compared with our experience with other <coughs> development in the region. And something in the area of 0 0.23, 0 0.27 school children per unit seems like a reasonable range. That, uh, that boggles my mind. Yeah. I mean, certainly in the one bedroom and maybe even the two bedroom, but not as much, and then you get a few, few of the three bedrooms. You're, you're saying there's not even going to be two kids there, one kid there, you know, half a kid. Based on uh, a very large um, sample of observations from around the region, this is what we're seeing right now in multifamily development. Exactly like yeah. these developments. Yes. So do they have the same school system that we're providing? There you go. Uh, this includes developments in, in Westford and other communities like Westford. Um, the, the observations that were included in LDS's analysis, most of those communities are more affluent communities, are communities that consider themselves to be magnets for um, school children. And nevertheless, they found, they, they concluded in a, a smaller school children per unit range than, um, than what we've seen throughout the region. So I think that it is an, an applicable sample that, that generates. <clears throat> Just a quick comment if I can, and, and you probably perhaps were not aware of it or whatever, but I'm, I'm not so sure that it's whether or not another community is affluent as Westford or vice versa. You know, I don't know how many awards or, or recognitions this town has got recently about the school system. And that's what they all come here for. I mean, I don't care whether Wellesley is as fluent as, as Westford is or whatever. They're going to come to Westford. They're not going to go to Wellesley for the school system. And, you know, I just, what worries me, and I think perhaps the rest of the board, is the calculations that we were given on Princeton down on 110 yeah, and what actually happened. You know, that's the key. Um, you, you know, you it seems know. awful low in your analysis, that's all. Chris? You know, you may not accept it, but this is actually pretty interesting. This RTG analysis that talks about schools. I mean, it really gets to the heart of what you're talking about and brings it back and compares it to other communities. So it's, you know, it's, you should look at it and you may not agree, but it, but it certainly answers some of the questions we're getting at. And I, I put the, R, we put the RKG study in, in your packet because it's been referenced by, in this discussion and in the back and forth, not necessarily that, and again, as Roberta has said, it's, it is a, was a more general study with a different purpose. But one of the things that that consultant looked at was comparing Abbott Mill, which is 130 apartments, with Princeton. And the number of school kids was much, much less in Abbott Mill. And so the distinction that she was making, again, in a general fashion, the RKG report, um, was that it depends on the project. Um, and so Princeton is a project in a bucolic setting with a playground, lots of green space. Abbott Mill is urban. Um, there are kids at Abbott Mill. It's not that they're not kids, but it's Good it's point. different. And it's the same school system. Yeah, yeah. So and Abbott Mill, they have um, they're <coughs> very similar rent structures, Abbott Mill and Princeton. So you have people paying the same amount um, for these uh, one and two bedroom units. Also Abbott Mill's all one and two bedroom, Princeton's all one and two bedroom, the, mm. the Piwa project. So I, it is an interesting, but it, it, it does draw these distinctions that it's not if Project A has, you know, 67 kids one year, it doesn't mean that Project B or C or D Would will the cost of the rental unit have a, a bearing on that, though? Yeah, yeah but Mills is a little well, higher, right? They're, they're very similar. No, they're, the, the cost of the rents at Princeton Project I, and I Abbott Mill are, are very similar. 
Um, what I wanted to just um, suggest to the board is just as Mr. Michaud um, articula articulated that uh, traffic analysis and traffic projection is um, kind of an art and a science and it's not precise and, and we don't know. I don't think either of these consultants would say that they know for a certainty that, you know, what the number of school kids is going to be. So perhaps one thing you might want to suggest is some post-occupancy monitoring. Um, and that is something that I've been working with some of my colleagues to understand how post-occupancy monitoring of multifamily projects or any large residential project allows you to say, let's say for example, if there's a threshold that is triggered, like if the, if the, if the number of, the, like literally year by year, every <coughs> October there's an enrollment in school. If there is additional enrollment, perhaps there's something that gets triggered, whether it's a mitigation payment or, or something, but that monitoring after occupancy is can just like it can be for traffic could also potentially be applied um, for school uh, enrollment you said we can condition mitigation on that well, you can't that's against the law I don't know why that was suggested I, I didn't was gonna say it is against yeah, yeah. Yeah. I am I just putting out that. there that there are other towns that are working on not necessarily 40b projects but are looking at looking at actual enrollment to see um, what you might want, you know, in order to determine what the impact of the school system is. I will say that's very rigorous on your planning department staff because it means a lot of follow-up work and monitoring. But again, just like you have the traffic, um, it is a way to get at um, what actually happens on the ground. Yeah, I, I don't know that I could agree with that or, or if I did, certainly it wouldn't be on an ongoing basis. It would be, you know, maybe a one-time shot or something. But uh, no, I understand that you know, these are projections to the best of your ability, whether it's this or traffic or whatever. Um, but <clears throat> some of it is eye-opening. I think our concern is we missed the bullseye by a lot in Princeton, so we're yeah. kind of more yeah. vigilant we're, we're, about we're, it. Not that we have we a solution. We run a little scared because of what yeah. happened. Yeah, we were really, uh, I think that the board had a sense at the time, we were hearing those numbers, that, you know, no way, and then I think the board sense came to fruition, and that sort of mm -hmm. gets us a little bit more vigilant at this point, but I don't know what our response to it is. I'm just saying that's probably the, the tenor. With your permission, I, I, I would like to respond and this this is a great uh, discussion and, and Chris certainly pointed out some of um, the things that we tried to point out um, and that's quite frankly why we gave you the range and the range that we gave you um, on the one hand on the best case scenario um, we're again estimating fiscal impacts here is uh, is very positive um, and in the worst case scenario it is um, uh, just positive on a yearly basis. However, um, the fiscal impacts to the community go beyond what you're going to be seeing on a yearly basis. You are going to be uh, receiving a substantial amount of, of one-time fees from the project. You also have and will continue to receive um, the benefits of roadway and other types of mitigation improvements. Um, there also is uh, consumer spending that will result by having um, residents. Um, and getting back to the point of the communities that we studied specifically with regard to school-age children, um, I absolutely agree that it, it is very clear, especially from what, what um, Princeton has shown, that Westford has a very desirable school system. However, the, the way that we looked at it was we looked at it not by on a per unit basis, but by a, a per two and three bedroom unit. Um, as um, Christine pointed out, our affordability level is, is substantially higher. It's high enough to the point that we're not going to be accepting voucher holders. Um, and in particular at Princeton, half of their units have, have vouchers. Those are, are households that are not just um, low income, but they're extremely low income down probably at the 30% 30, 30 level. And they have little housing choice so an opportunity for them to come to Westford is amazing and it's amazing that that opportunity is available to them. Can you repeat that statistic please again? So um, one half of the, of Princeton ha property. half of the 20 of the 40, 40 affordable units at um, Princeton are occupied by section 8 voucher holders. That's different than saying half of the units at Princeton property have vouchers. Half, Half of, of the, the affordable, affordable units. units. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry if I that was certainly not my intention to, to mislead you by saying that. Um, 
and um, and voucher holders um, have received a subsidy from the government. They typically pay about a third of their income towards rent. And when you peel back the layers again, typically they are their incomes are not at the 50 percent level. They're more at the 20 or 30 percent level. So when you think of housing choice, their choices are just really limited. So to to be able to to um, you know benefit from living in Westford. Um, that may go towards explaining some of the reasons why there may be more school-aged children at that project, as well as location, the number of um, two-bedroom units on a percentage basis, um, the, the playground, the amenities are geared more towards families. I think that differs from um, what um, is being proposed by the proponent. Um, and as far as the properties that we looked at, I mean, they, they are in Metro West communities. It's Needham, it's Newton, it's Concord, it's Natick, um, South Shore, Hingham. I mean, they're, they're, they are communities that I would, I would say are as, as desirable as this community, maybe, you know, when, when it comes to, come to the schools. Um, and um, we actually felt it was important to look at affordability and, 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 and kind of peel that out. Um, unfortunately, you cannot get out of a fiscal impact analysis how many students there are in two bedrooms or three bedrooms in a particular um, project. There are fair housing rules that apply. It's just, you know, so we do we do the best we do the best that we can. And if I, if I kind of can say in conclusion, you know, looking at either the, the 282 units, the 240 units. Um, under the, the best and worst case scenario, there still is, is a positive um, estimated bottom line on a, on a per yearly basis to the community. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So, Mr. Chair, um, the other um, thing that we wanted to follow up with, uh, with respect to the, the comments from the police department, or the, rather, excuse me, the fire department, uh, which we just received, and um, uh, deal with the connection, the emergency access connection, and the, the movement through uh, into the site. So, we have been um, working to try and address the comments uh, of the fire department. Um, and just to sort of recap some of the things that we've done thus far is uh, we've done the turning radius analysis. We've sort of indicated, we've um, um, responded to the comments around getting uh, fire truck access to more than one side of the building, which is what's required by code. And so we've done that by putting in pavers and, and um, material that would support the load of the fire truck and the outriggers along the interior portion of the site so that a fire truck could get access uh, through a mountable curb to the interior portion of the site. So those are some of the things that we've been able to control to, to um, allow for better fire truck access. The, um, as it relates to the emergency uh, access connection, uh, which we indicated we would seek um, uh, or at least reach out to the uh, abutter um, to try and get their uh, approval to uh, build that connection. Uh, we did hear back, um, and the, the letter um, See you, requesting sir. that was included in there. Uh, I just heard back today uh, from them, and they're requiring a, a fee of $100,000 in order to make that connection, uh, in addition to uh, request, requiring us to cover all of their legal costs. And so uh, when we got into um, the discussion uh, with them a little bit further about that, they also shared with me that the property has a loan on it and at the risk of uh, sort of, you know, having everyone's eyes glaze over, the type of loan that is encumbering that property is not a traditional bank loan whereby, uh, you know, you go to your lender and, and, and they make you a loan. It is um, a what's called securitized debt, a CMBS loan, which is a loan that gets chopped up into lots of little bits and then sold to investors, and then you've got a special servicer that services that loan. And there are, in fact, two loans, uh, a senior loan and then a second mortgage loan on that property, which would require uh, approval of not only the senior lender, but also the junior lender on that property. 
long way of saying that um, it wouldn't be a certainty that the special servicer would agree to uh, providing that easement, but even if they would, it would be a pretty expensive, um, onerous undertaking uh, to try and get approval. Um, so um, our view is that um, the cost of obtaining um, the, the, the easement and the cost of indemnifying them together with the cost of the road make that uh, an, an uneconomic um, proposition for us to pursue. And what we would uh, be agreeable to is building the roadway to that point, uh, after which there's maybe a 15-foot connection or grassed area to get to the other curbside, um, which would be at grade. And in an emergency situation, um, you know, I, I think it would be feasible for a fire truck to get there. Again, sort of keeping in mind that there already is a fairly direct way, primary access way to get into the site that doesn't require fire truck apparatus to cross through um, parking lots. Uh, and then there's a secondary, and I, I can just put this up on the, um, on the board here. Um, so the primary route, again, just off of uh, Route 110, comes down the main drive aisle uh, through this driveway and into the site. Um, this is a, a very you know, direct way into the site. You're not crossing through either one of these parking lots uh, or through the Netscout parking lot. Uh, and then, of course, the secondary um, way into the site, and there's a diagram here, um, allows for uh, crossing through this main drive aisle and then again down the main access way. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can come down this drive aisle uh, and again connect with the main uh, drive aisle. And in an absolute worst case situation where you'd have to have an obstruction at this point, um, that's really the only time that you would have to um, take this path in order to access the site. So there'd have to be an emergency at our, at the proposed residential project, and coincidentally, there'd have to be an obstruction at that location. So honestly, we, we, we feel that the secondary or the tertiary emergency access uh, connection isn't necessary, uh, given these uh, alternative ways of getting uh, to the site. Uh, but if, if um, it is a requirement, we would be willing to build the uh, road to three. Two questions. <clears throat> I've been down there many times. This is a straight shot with no impediments at all? Correct. What, what we're well, I thought that was kind well, of I'm sorry, what we're proposing curve down in there. It doesn't exist yet. It doesn't exist, right. Oh, so where the curve is... I'm sorry, uh, I'll just go back to the, so yeah, so there's a curve right here. Um, as you come down past Red Hat, right. yeah. there's a curve, and then there's another curve uh, existing to get into this parking lot and that parking lot. But from then on out, from, from that point forward, it would be a straight shot down. Okay, because in fact, I'm, I'm, I'm glad I asked that question, because in fact, I was going to say, in light of <clears throat> what you said tonight with regards to the response, I personally would rather see you spend your money on straightening this out for a straight shot rather than spending money and bringing it up to the property line. The only other concern, though, is when you come in, if you can put up your other one. Sure. Okay, that second one from Concord Road actually is through the parking lot, though. Can you make, but that would be yeah. the emergency if you want. Could you make an access at that corner right here, straight out to Concord Road, just to, right, right here? here? Yeah. That, uh, a little lower down, maybe? Uh, the grade there uh, prevents that. It's actually a fairly significant um, elevation change yeah. between those two. How much? Uh, <laughs> you told me about 20 feet and the areas are both. 
Correct. Mm -hmm. And and natu natural heritage um, weapons. Salamanders. <laughs> and turtles. We know about those. In, in fact, um, you know, we've we've looked at, uh, and we can sort of put this up uh, quickly. We've looked at making a pedestrian connection through that very same uh, location, and I apologize, this doesn't show up very very um, <coughs> vividly on, on uh, the screen there, but we looked at uh, providing a pedestrian connection as one of the other follow-up items from our uh, last meeting um, where we would, we would try and create a path up to that net scout entryway, mm -hmm. and um, this slide sort of indicates what would be required in order to achieve that um, which is a significant amount of tree clearing uh, and, and meandering switchbacks to get up to that elevation um, in, in addition to sort of going through the, the and disturbing the wetland um, area in that location. So even getting a path up there is difficult, let alone trying to get <clears throat> a, a fire truck uh, to that location. They want their coffee, they got to walk the long way. As Jimmy said at the last meeting, 10 years from now, Dunkin' Donuts might not even be there. True. Uh, Okay. Um, and if, if I could just to flag please. Uh, one thing the applicant said, just to, just to make sure that you caught the significance of it, that he said to do that would require would, would make the project uneconomic. Um, that's a that's a key term in Chapter Forty B. That you, um, essentially, I, I mean, not to put words in your mouth, but that basically I believe would mean that as a condition we would appeal to the HAC, saying that it's going to kill the project and. If a condition is, I mean, it wouldn't be up to you to decide does it make an economic, it would be up to the HAC. But if they found that condition essentially made it so the project doesn't work, that would be their, essentially the highest level of review of a condition. It wouldn't just be, well, you know, if the board wanted it, I guess it's an okay, like when you normally do zoning review, it would be the kind of thing where they would, yeah. if the numbers supported that contention, it would be a, a really hard sell. I mean, you, you would be going with your fire department <coughs> up against it, but it would be something where they would look very carefully at it. Yeah, no, this this board is well aware of what right, un okay. uneconomic means. And I'm not accusing I didn't, the, the, the applicant of threatening, but more no, just no, making no, sure no, what no. that means. I didn't time. hear him say uneconomic, no. but we know what it's all about, yeah. yeah. Um, did you have anything else? Um, do the revised yes, plan right. Set. So um, the other thing that we'd like to just go through again as a follow-up to uh, the prior hearing was to uh, update the board on some of the changes that we've made uh, regarding some of the comments from the tie and bond uh, civil review as well as uh, the um, internal circulation, uh, or not, excuse me, not internal circulation, some suggestions that were made with respect to screening, uh, fencing around detention basins, etc. And um, for that, I'd just like uh, Will Park from Sims Main to kind of walk you through uh, the site plan indicating those um, updates. Thank you. site next to building B and again next to the parking structures south of building C. Some of the comments were in regards to landscaping and screening. We submitted a revised landscaping plan that uh, ha addressed the 50% evergreen requirement in landscaping and screening areas. So we're all aware that the uh, gravel processing area is down to the south and east of the site. So for those areas around the south and east of the site, you'll see that the 
uh, plants are updated so it's 50% evergreens on these sides of the built of the property. Along the north and west, we maintain the um, kind of boulevard feel that we prefer on those longer drags of ma maple trees, predominantly maple trees, but those um, lines of sight don't really require the screening that it does to the south. If I can just interrupt you for a second, what is the other 50% down there? Ooh. Maple trees, cherries, oaks. So all, all hardwoods? Yes. Which, which um, in the fall and winter, uh, yeah. no screening at all. So that's why it says the 50% requirement, so that some of that is maintained in the winter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. We may look at a little more than 50%, I'm not sure. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So we have a, a memorandum from the Conservation Resource Planner. Are you going to address that? Yes. Um, so, so, yeah, okay. We got some. Yes. Um, I'll let you, I'll just yeah. that. We'll continue sure. for now. Yeah. I think that addresses all the comments really from the the, the latest round uh, of revisions from Pine Bond. Uh, there were some other comments in the memorandum that uh, items that you wanted to discuss this evening. Uh, those included uh, snow removal. Uh, there's plenty of areas around the perimeter of the site. As you can see on the C121 plans, there's plenty of areas around the perimeter of the site and some on the interior, especially in the dispersal field area where we're not allowed to have plantings in the islands because of the dispersal field area and the pavement, uh, where there's plenty of room for snow removal. And then, of course, this whole area here, uh, the future parking area that the applicant owns, if there's a need for a lot of storage, it can always be close there as well. Can you put that other plant back up that had the trees on it, like putting side by side? Side by side? Well, yeah, so one plan you have trees, the other plan is where you're going to put the snow. So wh what is it going to be? Here there's opportunities still around the perimeter and on the interior, uh, interior islands. I guess you've never plowed snow before, huh? That's a lot of that's a lot of snow to put that's up a ton of snow to be putting in here and there and everywhere. Sure I mean that's that's a big parking lot. Yeah, that's yeah. a little it's ridiculous. Yes, uh, actually on, on the screen now is a plan that shows a number of proposed locations. These don't need to be all of the locations, but um, certainly in in this area here, which is going to be. Um, uh, landscaped or, or, or open, rather, um, uh, there's an opportunity to put snow there. This is the location that Will was referencing, but there's um, several locations. This island um, can accommodate um, snow as well as um, the area adjacent to the uh, wastewater treatment facility just south of uh, the trail leading to it. Do you feel there will they'll, they'll be suffice? Yeah. Yeah. You think they'll yeah. suffice for the amount of snow that we could I'm not a civil use? engineer, and I'm sure our consultant can address this, but if you've got a square foot of parking lot with a foot of snow, you need a square foot of storage area to put that same foot of snow. You're not even close. Close. I think you find you need most of that. Jean, do you want to come up to the mm -hmm. microphone? Just so that the yeah. recording can capture you. Absolutely. Um, and for the record, Jean Christie with Tiny Bomb. Um, this is one thing I hadn't really put a whole lot of thought into, but I'm, I'm talking about it now. I think because that upper west, you know, plan west, um, that parking area isn't proposed to be a parking area at this time, it may be a future one. Um, as for this project, that's probably the best location for it. There's enough space. If it's grass, it's not going to be. Um, a problem to the stormwater management system. Um, so I think that would work. I think, you know, some of these smaller areas have some opportunity, but not enough. I agree. So that's not a pocket area right now? 
It's it, no, it's intended to be um, future parking to the extent that it needs to be uh, built. It's going to be. Um, we're proposing to land bank that um, parking area. Now, for this project, the net scum. For this project, it's a long way when away. They, when they dropped the number of units, right. that that parking lot was not no longer needed um, for parking. So now there's two spots per unit, or one point something. One point seven seven. Uh, spaces per unit, and then we also have an opportunity for shared parking with um, the next parking lot. Uh, but uh, without building that ad additional parking, there are 1.77 spaces per and unit. So the shared spot at Netsco is, is, is above and beyond what they're required for that square footage of building. Uh, correct. Just Let me just do a quick spin off of that, and I, again, I don't want to belabor this issue either. <clears throat> is the Netsco building full? Uh, it is fully. It is not full. Uh, it is fully leased to Netsco, uh, but an, um, you know, a third of that uh, building is uh, sort of flex um, light uh, assembly type space, and so the number of uh, you know, occupants per unit in that type of space is a lot lower than what you would have in a traditional office building with lots of cubicles. And so the, the ground floor, if you walk through the entire ground floor of that building, it's mainly sort of assembly and storage space for the components that they... Re the reason I ask, well, actually two reasons, because you've talked more than once about shared parking. And, and in the upper, I'll call it the upper lot towards the entrance of Netscout, that parking lot is never even half full. You've added parking lots behind that scout, and I don't know how full those are, um, but you feel there is still plenty of room should you need shared parking. We do. Um, that The parking lots, and I'll just sort of go to it here. So this um, lower parking lot here, uh, again, this is uh, Concord Road yeah. over here. This lower parking lot, in particular, this uh, section here uh, uh, contains about 100 stalls. Um, this section is generally um, empty. And the low, so if, if we carved out 80 spaces um, from that uh, lower stall, that would bring our parking count up to 2.0 .2 um, for the for the apartments, um, and we think we could accommodate that, especially given the alternating um, timing that uh, residents are going to use parking compared to office workers. How how full is this parking lot that you've added? Uh, that one is more full. Um, that parking uh, lot actually is um, there's an easement with Red Hat whereby Red Hat actually. Uh, um, occupies 40 stalls uh, in that lot. Do you know where all the snow goes up to the other sites, the other parking lots? Um, I, I don't know offhand where they, I, I'd be guessing. There's a fair store. amount of vacant parking lot yeah. that's yeah. built. Um, it's it's my, exper my experience of it is there's a lot of empty parking <clears throat> spaces, and so the, yeah. the current parking lot. That's why I asked you whether really or not that yeah. building was full, but it, it isn't. It it's isn't totally leased, but it's not only because uh, by design. So they don't; they just don't have the number of workers Population. in that building that you would normally have in a in a, an office building where you just have you know cubicles. Because they don't need them or can't get them. Because they don't need them. Because what they're doing, what they're utilizing the space for, is yeah. not. It's okay. not you know the kind of uh, you know office. It's not an office use requirement. Okay. Okay. Good. It's a good conversation, and maybe there's a simple diagram that might be able to show the board, you know, for the part, you know, including phase one yep. with Red Hat and Net Scout, you know, who, who parks where. Um, some of us are more familiar with that than others, but um, I think the board, okay. it would be helpful. And um, I don't recall if in your waivers for the comp permit, um, because um, this lot, is it in your subject area for the comprehensive permit? The shared uh, mm -hmm. the net scout mm -hmm. lot is yeah. not okay. So would you be um, so that's okay, um, but maybe um, some description of that. I, I don't know that. And again, maybe correct me. 
there's a lot of paper here <laughs> if you've addressed this already but I do think the board is very interested in the parking and so um, how that works because I am aware of the special permits for phase one does include a lot of information about parking and how the parking works are you asking for the comp permit to also grant some kind of waiver for that parking area um, do you want to add that to the subject site do we have an agreement I know you control it as the as the property owner but just how will that work and could you maybe give us a little bit more information about the it, shared situation it does seem like it might be helpful for the applicant to know from the board is you know is 1.77 spots per unit going to be enough are you going to ask for two you know so what what's the target they need to get to and then they'll show it to you and if they can do it that's problem is that a reasonable way to approach it because I mean, I think there's a there's a thermal where if we can give them direction, well, then we set the we set the target and they have to meet it. So we, I'm saying he's going to bring that that scale parking into his project. No, I'm just um, I'm sure just wondering about how it's going to be handled right. basically because we have park planning board decisions that govern that phase, okay. um, but in the comprehensive permit process, you guys are the board that addresses everything. So for example, if I, I believe they actually did ask for a waiver for parking, um, and, and that I recall because it would be too. Uh, all, um, yeah, all I mean to suggest is I think there's been a fair amount where the applicant has suggested, you know, well, we could do it this way, we could do it both uh, parking and other things, even the height of the building. We could do it this way, we could do it that way. There's a an element where that can become frustrating for you guys because you're not quite sure which are we reviewing here. You know, is it does it include this or not include that? So I think the well, more you start saying this is <coughs> going to be two per unit, or it's going to be yeah. And Dan, yeah, what, you know, one of the questions about this whole development is the density, and it really plays to the last paragraph on the memorandum from Carol Gumbar. And you, you're, you're describing this, and, and what her comment was, uh, there's very little open space provided to the residents due to the density, high number of units, and parking. And you know there would be a benefit of more woods than just the line of trees, more green space. So I, I think you've got to get serious about that site and you can't you're jamming it in there and you're I think you're doing a little bit of double counting snow trees parking lots so at the end of the day I think you got to show us a plan here it is that's what we're proposing here not sort of a show game well um, so a number of things just to follow up on that that's um, I, well, I probably should have uh, started the meeting by making it clear that we were agreeing to reduce the number of units to 240 units. But um, that it has got nothing to do with the amount of land you have in the footprint. That doesn't impact the footprint of the buildings. Correct. It does give you some relief on parking. Correct. My yeah. points are sort of the land planning around this development in this park. It's, well, I'm kind of uncomfortable with where this is going because you keep kicking the can down the road. Well, and the other part that kind of bothers me about the whole thing is right now Guterres owns it all. What if you permit this and sell it or a year or two down the road you sell it and now Guterres doesn't own that piece of the pie, but they still have the shared parking, the snow removal area, all this other stuff. So that's yeah, so. So let me, let's just let me just back up um, and and try and clarify a couple of things. Um, the with respect to the um, number of parking stalls, what we were trying to do was respond to some of the comments around having more <coughs> open space, more um, green space. And by reducing the number of units from 282 to 240, we felt uh, that we could um, not have to build the uh, additional parking along um, the western portion of the site. So that but space. But to David's point, excuse me, to David's point, the footprint hasn't changed. 
it's still the same footprint, whether it's five stories, no, four they, stories. If they reduce, hot I understand that, but as far as, but it doesn't create no, just that one park. Just that's that one the park only space one. That's it's not creating any. You're not creating any green spaces in between. You're not adding anything. Yeah, you 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 add by subtraction the parking spot, but that's about it. Well, it is more green space than there would have been under the previously approved plan for the office park, and I think that's supposed to be the comparison, not Greenville. Yes, but not that's necessarily so, because development I, demands <coughs> other kinds of space that an office building wouldn't. Let me, let me give you, for instance, you have a, a, a Princeton property. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have a, a, a community garden. It holds. They, they do it on a lottery, so maybe 20 people out of that whole unit yep. can get into the community garden. They didn't. They got a lot of land on it. They didn't use it. They didn't utilize it at all, as far as I'm concerned, for the tenants. And people are on lists down there to get into the community garden. I mean, do you have anything proposed for this site like that? Uh, we do. Um, it doesn't show. We. <laughs> Uh, I apologize for that. It's we were trying to sort of address the the comments for this hearing. Okay. Um, we can certainly develop that further, uh, um, but we, as part of the architectural review, I guess the question with respect to open space, one of the things that we did try and point out during the architectural review was the fair amount of um, green space that we were trying to create uh, with. Uh, <laughs> And um, that that's actually a fairly generous amount of, uh, of, of open space. And we thought that, that we had sort of addressed the concern around uh, the, the building footprint per se. So what we've tried to do beyond that green space, which we think is you know, fairly generous, it's, it's 100, more than 100 feet wide by you know, more than 200 feet long, um, certainly a lot larger than um, some of the other comparable projects that we've looked at. We thought that we were creating um, that, that kind of uh, green space. In addition to that, I guess what we're trying to um, uh, uh, establish now by, by requesting the waiver from the 2.0 parking stalls per unit is to provide other opportunities for green space, for community garden, um, and, and sort of uh, more natural uh, type space in that um, segment that that is off onto the um, onto the western side, so not not trying to um, you know change anything. Uh, is that your property line? Yes, I mean we're built we're building on our property line. Yes, uh, and you don't own any of this. Is this still not domes? Correct. The other interesting thing to keep in mind regarding the parking is that there is no established. You know this. There's no established parking requirement for the multifamily buildings. It's two spaces per unit for a single-family home. That's all that's required in a, in a typical subdivision. So our request was a waiver of whatever standard or it may apply for multifamily down to 1.7, uh, which is not significantly different from the two required for a single-family home. But were you saying that you were, you were looking for the one... 0.77, so you could use that whole western portion as open space. Was that what you were saying? Correct. Okay. Yeah. By by reducing the number of units by um, uh, to 240, that frees up that segment um, uh, from having to be parked, and um, to the extent that we would need additional parking in the future, we could try and achieve that through shared parking, which I think again is something that we're trying to do in order to reduce the amount of. Of so, parking that we have to so build. So, just to be clear, your 1.77 doesn't include Netscape right now. It does not. Okay. It does not. Or that western. Or that western. Part. Yeah, no, I understand that, but the other one. And <clears throat> what is the area where it says gated access? That was uh, what we were going to propose. This is an old, an, an old slide. Uh, the elevation that for the secondary for the emergency access. Don't have to but die. that could be used for green space. Yes. Is it wooded? Or? It is. It is currently wooded. It's a, that's a pretty significant area, isn't it? Yeah, it's not. It's property line, isn't it? Huh? Try to be answered. Yeah, correct. Right. Tree line? I don't know where the property line is there. Where's the property line? Where it's it? <clears throat> I'm sorry. Back to the where, it's, where it says gated access, you own that. No, no. This oh, that's the thing we're going to rent. 
that's that's the connection that we were trying to make uh, before. So where is the property line? Yet? I think it's a tree line. line. Maybe. Tree line. Oh, it's probably easiest to just see it on this on this plan here. It's a little scrub there anyway. It's not big. It's not old growth there. Yeah, but we can make them clean. No, I understand that. that. I understand that. What I'm saying. The property line runs along. Well, it goes into this lot that used to have the yeah. additional parking for the uh, right. 280 units. Yeah. And it goes back on, goes down the tree line. Down along the tree line, then back in here. Okay. So that access we were, were proposing was down here. That doesn't work because of grades. So now we're back up here. So you were wondering if this area could be used for open space, and the answer is yes. Can you put the, uh, yeah. can uh, you put that other one back up? Sure. No, what I what I was looking at was this area here. But you no, they don't own that. No, we don't that's own that. That's area. Above no. those trees okay. are they own, right? But, but, you yeah. own, but you own this down in here. Correct. And above it. With the, over, with to the yeah. left, over to the no, left. To the left. Top. To the left. Top. 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 Yeah. Down. 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 Flip that up, like bring the open space closer to the middle and use that western area for parking. I'm sorry. Say, well, so you said that whole upper mm -hmm. western parking lot can be open space. <laughs> open space this and park in here. Or, or no, park, park, park up well there. Up there. Up there. Then why not do that? Wait your mind. Um, if, if, I mean, if the desire is to have more open space that's used rather than you know the back nine up there that well, yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's the, I think that's the tenor of what's going on here even though they claim that that internal piece is, is fairly large uh, I mean one of our thoughts down and I hate to keep referring to Princeton as we but that's you know um, I mean they had a whole hunk of land in in Westford and Chumsford that you can go and get a bunch of guys and get a ball game going you're not going to have a ball game in the middle of that those buildings So I think I think the sentiment is is let's see if we can get some more open space. So this this slide shows um, one of the one of the um, uh, proposals that uh, we're working on uh, that uh, comes out of the comments from the Conservation Commission, and that is to try and create um, a, a trail around uh, this wetland down here, um, and so this would be a um, a pathway uh, that would allow that. Um, uh, residents to uh, sort of utilize this space so that's providing some some um, uh, additional outdoor um, uh, recreation space this is this the um, the parking area that would no longer uh, be um, utilized in the 240 unit scheme so you'd have you know these three sort of areas of um, uh, open space or, or, or at least outdoor space that could but, be utilized. But if it's wetlands, it's not open space. Correct. It's not, it would not be open space. It would be just a trail. Wetlands <coughs> with a trail. Correct. Maybe so, you could use community gardens up on a and portion the of that. And the community yard. gardens are not something that we have a design for, but we've spoken space. with um, a oh, yeah. community well, garden group middle, based here in Westford where we would plan to put something you know, on, yeah, on that yeah, space there, on, on uh, this yeah. green space here. Yeah. <coughs> and that's just, how many spaces were proposed to be up there? 80, 80 or so. I don't have the exact number, but there were about 80 spaces there. So, I mean, is there any way you could take the bottom building it shifted towards that parking lot a little more and make your courtyard bigger and put the 80 spaces back up there so the, this this parking field has been um, designed based on the um, the uh, stormwater uh, recharge system which I'm sorry waste wastewater uh, recharge system not stormwater thank you um, which uh, you know where the soils in this location are um, you know appropriate for uh, that use and there just isn't the ability to do that uh, okay. in this section. That's sort of the, the genesis of the site plan um, uh, is around that uh, particular feature. I mean, I just don't it, think making green space that far away from all those buildings, the residents probably aren't going to, most of them probably aren't going to go all the way over there and enjoy it. The people from Red Hat and Netscout <laughs> are going to enjoy it more than the tenants. <laughs> 
<clears throat> but this is, I mean, this this is a, this site is challenging. It is, and and you know you got, I think the develop developers got to come back with some creative ideas. I mean, this is not, you know, I think community gardens are out of the question because there's no room. You can't double count the wetlands. The wetlands are no, wetlands. No. You can put in a nice trail. So you still got the problem of coming up with some open space where kids could play or fool around. They're not going to play in that courtyard. Do we, mm. do you have a triangular property that's mm -hmm. adjacent <laughs> to your site <laughs> yeah, you own, that you own? Yeah. Yeah, we know. That is um, a really nice open space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just Sounds saying, like the board's saying. even looking a little less than 240. I don't. I don't know how you would get uh, uh, to that space, but I mean, we can certainly look at at that. I think you need to take another look at things. From what I'm hearing. We can figure the building. Stagger, go step them down. Mr. Chair, would it be helpful if I um, we took a look at the staff report with the table of items because some of them have been addressed, um, or unless the applicant wants to. Add some no, I think it'd be helpful to go through that list so that we can click some things off, you know, withstanding the recent discussion to start over again. Well, we just to start over. So the board had asked, <clears throat> and we'll try and do this for your other project um, as well, maybe a little earlier so that now that we're really humming here on our 40B process, um, the board had asked for a list of um, issues that had been outstanding. Um, in addition, we provided the board with its correspondence list so you can kind of you know, see and track all the correspondence that we've gotten to date. And these are, so I'm looking at the staff report that was, that should have been at the beginning of your packet. Um, like the first thing, um, and it's on page two. Um, and th there's no particular order to this. Um, I didn't even divide. I didn't even kind of give it categories. I just went through the list, um, really going back to the earliest um, conversations that the board had. So we had the emergency access easement, and we've heard from the applicant today that um, this appears to be a no go based on their um, uh, explorations with the um, adjacent property owner. Um, the next thing I noted was, um, and this was right from the very first meeting, um, concern from the board about the parking spaces um, and the shared parking. So again, I'm, anything we can do to help, uh, you've had some discussion tonight, um, but uh, it sounds like this is still an ongoing issue for the board. Um, the fifth story and number of units um, has been, the applicant has addressed, they've removed the fifth story, they've reduced the units down to 240 from 282. Um, the uh, board was concerned about lack of screening. So I did this staff report right about the day that <laughs> the um, revised plans came in. So this actually has been addressed on the plans that were just received. And um, Jean, we, did, I mean, we didn't give you a chance to kind of you know, totally um, jump in here, but um, I'll go back through this. And it, I, I, I heard some comments from the board that there may be still some you know, additional concerns, but they have at least heard the board and addressed it in their plans um, for that in particular, but the buffering between 37 Powers Road uh, and Rodon property. <coughs> um, uh, here we get to some of the transportation uh, issues that were identified by Bob Michaud. Um, and I believe that TEC indicated in their memos that these conditions were acceptable to the applicant. Um, and that included the post occupancy signal timing that we had a, a discussion about earlier. Um, transportation demand management um, uh, measures um, also seem to be um, acceptable to, from TEC. Um, need for pedestrian facilities, um, in particular near Route 110 and the Concord Road driveway. And the applicant has prepared um, a variety of um, studies, engineering studies, um, and to look at what an ADA compliant path that goes up towards 110 on that eastern side of their property um, uh, and, and, and the amount of tree clearing that it would um, require and switchbacks. It just is, is quite a large, large project. 
um, and an SMMA in, again did another study just on a short connection, pedestrian connection up to Concord Road that um, uh, Mr. Lopez um, provided to you earlier. Uh, and again, you know, even that short connection to, to the driveway entrance at Concord Road um, is a large amount of clearing. Um, uh, we, the board has um, wanted improved vehicular circulation, and again, TEC addressed that. And you had a discussion really at your last meeting. Um, seemed to be relatively satisfied about removing some of the speed bumps. Um, we've looked at the um, turn, auto turn um, movements, and there's the concerns seem to be addressed to some extent. We had the police memo about the physical impact analysis. Um, that was discussed this evening. Um, Ms. Sweet has provided a revised um, document correcting <clears throat> the typos and responding point by point to the police, uh, Captain Chambers' um, memo. I would like to circle back to Captain Chambers and you know see what his response is to, to Lynn's uh, materials. And that wasn't timely for today's um, tonight's meeting. Um, we have uh, Mr. Alphen um, uh, has uh, addressed the modification of existing special permits in a letter early on in the process that was probably part of the application materials. Um, so to that, to the extent that Mr. Alphen has put forward um, his um, request to the board um, about uh, dealing with the um, existing special permits and modifying them if, if necessary, um, so that is just to be clear for you. And we have not focused on this, and I think that might be something we want to add to our, our list of things to address in, so, the, in so, the next so. meeting. And, and as well, just let me finish my sentence, um, there is um, potential actions rel relative to a development agreement that may or may not sit with this board. So a couple things. Um, one of the, we had some legal issues that we were discussing with town council. Last conversation I had with town council was on the 4th of March to which I think if I'm paraphrasing, she says, you know, I think I'm okay with this. Let me just talk to some other people in the office and I'll get back to you. So I'm gonna circle around back with her and you the next couple of days to make sure we get some closure on that. Maybe come up with some proposed language and how we deal with the whole special permit thing. On the development agreement, uh, because we've already made a commitment to pay the same money that we would have been paying if we had been building office space out of the development agreement, I guess we need to know whether you think that we could put in a condition of approval that says that, you know, in light of the fact the office space isn't being built, the applicant has agreed, happily agreed, to generously donate, um, you know, the funds one-to-one uh, -one as they would be in the development agreement, or whether it would have to go to the planning board to amend the development agreement to say the same thing. And, you know, we've got the ability to do it both ways. Um, it's just a matter of, of process. And, and I think that if, we, if, if somebody decided that we needed to get the planning board to do it, what we'd like to do is to, is to draft the amendment and give it to you and have you take it to the planning board so that the planning board doesn't think that they've now become the zoning board and they're, they're going to review our project, if you know what I mean. With all due respect to my good friends on the planning board that may be watching this uh, because <laughs> they have nothing else to do. Yep. No, I understand that, and, I, and that's still pending, I think. All right. Well, we, we'd like to... Yep, Can, get, we'll continue. You and I will continue yep. that discussion. That's correct, and I, right. and because when you originally, yes, and you, I want to be really clear about what the mitigation offer is, because you actually said one to one based on square footage, and right. so if the square footage is less because you've dropped units, I'd like to know. We should be you should be clear to the board what is the proposed mitigation. Um, but so I do think that we'd like to put that on the agenda for the next meeting and hopefully we'll have, get clarification. And so this has been something that we've been working on closely with town council and the applicants council really even since the, before, when we first heard about the project um, last fall when they went for their funding with mass housing. And um, so we're, we've been having a lot of discussion, but we obviously need to bring that to the board to make it clear to you. Um, uh, we have something the board has not talked about is lighting. Um, lighting plans. I don't know what kind of lighting fixtures are proposed, or maybe maybe um, Simes McKee could could remind me. But um, you know, lighting is important. I will say the planning board spent a lot of time on lighting for this area, um, and so it needs to be safe. Um, but it also too much lighting is too much lighting. So um, that is something that I think. Um, unless I've missed it, um, hasn't come up yet. And one of the things you'll also see between now and the next meeting is a uh, request for a waiver so that the 
uh, lighting requirements can be consistent with that which you have approved in other parts of the office park. Uh, in other parts of the office park, we've had to go to the zoning board to obtain variances so we can go to 30 foot poles and uh, was it uh, 0.2 uh, foot candles? Um, uh, on the, because the town of Westford zoning bylaw lighting requirements are extreme and they create too much lighting. And so we'll ask for a waiver consistent with how you've treated other parts of the office park. I, and without commenting about what the board wants, um, there is there is the amount of lighting that's required in the zoning bylaw, but then there's also the height. And so whether you want it, you're looking to go higher than what's allowed, and whereas this is a we want a residential feeling, this 30 foot light pole may not feel like a residential neighborhood. Um, but I'll let the board um, agree on that. So um, just turning over to the next page, um, mitigation package. Again, I've said 150,000 here for the mitigation package. That's based on a one-to-one -one of 300,000. I don't know if that's changing based on the change in units. Um, but that's um, next meeting. We'll get, get at that specifically. Uh, trash and recycling um, was part of the plans that, that you just got. So um, that has been added to the plans and we'll wait for um, the peer reviewer to look at that for adequacy. We do want to be clear that um, trash and recycling is private. First of all, that recycling is part of it. Um, we want to make add that and that that will be private and will always be private, which is what we you generally do. Um, and I would just say from this point forward, um, we want to make sure that that's done privately and not by the town. And there's no expectation by future tenants that it would be done by the town. Um, stormwater management permit uh, um, information is coming, but not, you didn't get it for this meeting or the full report? Correct. So yeah. We so we'll, we'll change that for the, for the May. Yeah. Um, the list of waivers, I think we just want to go back through, um, and this is really for the board as well as for the applicant to see with the changes that are going on, are there any new waivers that you'd like to request? And we'd like to start zeroing in on those lists of waivers. Um, and it's for the board then to you know, look at their schedule and see when they want to look at those. Um, and then are you conducting a water system study <coughs> for the water department? Uh, we will be. And will that be done prior to the permit yeah. decision? Uh, I, um, I, I think we're, um, I'm not sure. So it'll be conditioned. I mean, then you know what you would expect from the board would be conditioned. But I just I haven't gotten any update. I, that hasn't been part of the record here. Um, it has been in other 40B projects. Um, so. I'm not sure what the board's interested is. The issues I got from tonight are snow storage and community garden. I have no question. We haven't talked anything about school bus pickup. What's the plan for school busing? There. Gonna, there. You're going to have to walk out to 110? No, um, and we had provided a plan for this early on in the application process. We showed some diagrams for the school bus uh, plan, and, and um, it would be uh, internal within the site. That's okay. As long as you addressed it, I, I would just add. I think the this, the note I would say is that that needs to be sent. We we need to do a job internally here in the town to make sure the school um, department has that and their bus contractor sees it. We've been down this road before. You guys haven't, but we have, and um, it's really important. They don't like to go into private property, um, and so we really would like to check it with the school department. They have a contractor. Obviously, the contractor potentially could change, but at least consult with our current contractor. Um, um, and so uh, Ezra is reminding me um, for an extension of the timeline, and I just asked the applicant. We had originally calculated May 17th as the hearing that was the last hearing after 180 days. Um, as you can see, we have a list of items, some of which have been um, addressed, but not all of which have been addressed. I'm still, you know, waiting for some um, additional things from you and, um, from, and responses from you and the peer reviewers, circling back with the peer reviewers. So we would appreciate an extension in writing um, to, for the board's um, ability to, time to act. What's your meeting schedule look like? So um, the next meeting will be uh, 
the 40B meetings are this fourth Monday. So the next meeting is May 22nd. The following meeting after that is Monday, June 26th. And what we have planned. Um, as far as tidying up all these things you just mentioned. But right. Yes, right. Yeah. The lighting. So it would not be May 17th because the board is choosing to have 40B projects on these fourth Mondays. So yeah, it would be really, I think, getting at this 20, 22nd, 22nd, 22nd yeah. the fourth Monday. So really, all of the things that have have yet to be addressed here. I think what we would be hoping for was an extension that would allow the board to gather the last information on this, have a meeting on the 22nd, hopefully put almost all this to bed, maybe one more meeting. The June meeting could then be the ideal one. Yeah, and you know we're, we're um, certainly agreeable to providing an extension. Um, uh, you know we hope to come back uh, at the next hearing and sort of uh, you know follow up on some of the items that have been um, discussed here tonight. Um, and um, right. uh, so with that you know I don't want to. You know. and, and you'll you'll see if you see the schedule we have. We've been trying to have a fairly aggressive schedule, yep. but things occasionally slip down. But. One of the one of the biggest things I think you need to leave here tonight with, <clears throat> and that certainly is not to give you heart palpitations to reinvent the wheel, but it's a little bit more than just community gardens. Um, I think I'm hearing footprint to give people more open space, some place that they can get together and have a softball game or something like that, and that certainly isn't going to happen in your court yet. So um, I don't think the lighting plans are as important until we get defined with regards to the size of this project. And I think I can safely say for the board that, you know, we appreciate you lopping off that fifth story, but there's still some work to be done. Okay. Anything else? So um, when do you need the extension to? <clears throat> uh, we would like in writing, um, always, and uh, I would say to June 26 for the board to act. But um, you can give it a month at a time. I mean, different yeah, applicants, because, uh, I mean, different I, applicants I have different approaches to it. I don't see there. this thing coming near closure yeah. next month. Different people do it differently. But I could be wrong. I still want Whatever you normally do, but yeah, Miss. I will again just to repeat. Um, Miss Ralphin likes to have a form that is signed by the board and accepted by the board. Other applicants just we take a written email that says I hereby extend mm. the time for the board to act to blank. So you guys oh, can do it you. however you would like. Um, I'm the board has accepted in the past okay. um, written communication, which would be an email. No, I'll it send could you. be more formal. Yeah, Doesn't send, matter to me. I will send you a uh, letter and give you an extension beyond certainly. Uh, May 22nd, um, and I'll discuss with, uh, are we going to give an extension to June? Uh, it would be, I, I would recommend it, the, I mean, the other option is they have to close the hearing, right. and then they can still. We don't want to close the hearing. hearing. So that, that's what's nice about, yeah. you know, keep open hearings with this new information. So when's your June meeting? June 26th. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So thank you, and um, again, any member of the board, I think you've been pretty clear here tonight about what other information you'd like in order to render a decision. And that's really kind of what, you know, we need to make sure we're communicating with the applicant and what they need. When they're extending this to? They are, need, they, we need a motion to continue to May 22nd. So moved. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? So Aye. All those motion carries. Thank you. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you very much. <clears throat>